Coming up this week on the MarkCast, we are talking XFL contracts versus USFL contracts in the words of famed sports agent Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! Do people still even understand that reference? I don't know. We have Greg Parks of XFL Board joining the show, making his return, talking all things XFL cities, announcements, and really breaking down uh, what timeline would be better for players in the XFL or the USFL trying to get into the NFL. If you compare it to USFL 2023, that may be the more apt comparison uh, because players right now, that's what they're going to have to decide between. They're going to decide between not what the USFL already paid, but what they will be paying versus what the XFL will be paying. And um, I don't know that the USFL has come out and said any changes in their contract structure, but you know, if they're going to be competing for players with the XFL toward the end of NFL training camp, it would behoove them to come out and say, hey, you know, this is what we're going to be offering next year. So the players and agents have something to compare to. In lots of CFL content this week, a friend of the show returning, Milt Stiegel, CFL Hall of Famer, talking all sorts of stuff, you know, drama on the CFL TSN panel, talking Gary Stern, what do we think of Matt Dunnigan's beard, lots more. He had to change it up. Would I ever cover up this beauty? No, not saying Matt is ugly, but you know, every now and then you got to change your looks up. You know, you you, you want to make things different, but I have no problem with it. You know, Matt keeps himself in shape. He works out hard, so uh, I have no problem with it. Sarah Saeed of the Parlay Canada stopping by, talking her experiences, joining the world of CFL media, covering the Argonauts, and doing other daily picks for the CFL. And then Simone Eli, tremendous, tremendous interview this week, covering all of the MLFB drama in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, 30 plus minutes with Simone breaking down the catastrophe that is the downfall of Major League Football. It was alive from the beginning. We're seeing the fallout continue. Then they're pulling paychecks from everybody. I mean, why even try to continue? I'll tell you why. Because he thought people would continue to try to invest into this into this company. Hey guys, welcome to the MarkCast. Reed here. Uh, it should be a tremendously fun show this week. I am battling wind. We have airplane noise and everything else coming to you this week. Normally, I'm out on the deck. Uh, Seafair this weekend in Seattle, so we're diverting a lot of the planes overhead of my house. Uh, we'll try to keep the intro brief today. Really stacked show. As always, four wonderful guests this week, including the last minute edition of Simone Eli, which uh, I am telling you, even if you don't know everything that's going on with the MLFB drama. I would definitely stick around for that one. Really glad Simone could come on. Uh, Greg Parks, long time. Uh, I'm a long time fan of Greg and the work he has done over at PW Torch uh, covering WWE with Wade Keller and his time on XFL board talking all things XFL. Comes back to the show. Really excited to talk with Greg. We had our big XFL insider, Mike Mitchell, on last week. I thought this was a good spot for Greg this week. Greg had written a big article about the Doug Whaley, Russ Giglio, uh, Neil Stratton uh, inside the league. They did the big Zoom conference last week, uh, really breaking down the XFL player contracts, timelines, you know, are we signing players before the draft? What are we paying them? We're taking care of housing, all that stuff. That kind of got overshadowed last week with Mike Mitchell's interview, right? We were so focused on like the cities and the hub and all that. So I thought it was really great to get Greg on to talk through all of that stuff. Obviously, we get Greg's thoughts on you know the Texas Triangle and the Arlington Hub and all of that, but a really good breaking down, like really what is the better timeline for players trying to get into the NFL? You know, uh, should the XFL be worried? Like, do they need to sign players on? Can they get them after they complete a USFL season? Uh, where does, uh, you know, the XFL release fall in line with the NFL uh, training camps? Lots of really uh, insightful stuff from Greg. I thought we had a really like fruitful conversation trying to figure out all of that stuff. Really worth the listen. Lots of CFL content this week. I'm really happy to have a CFL Hall of Famer, a you know, member of the CFL on TSM panel, Milt Stiegel, coming back on the show. Uh, you could, if you know Milt, you know he is very uh, verbose, uh, opinionated. Really appreciate having Milt uh, stop by, talk all things CFL, get his thoughts on the Alouettes, the coaching changes there, Gary Stern and his like Twitter feud. You know, Milt and Gary have kind of been going back and forth. I also really wanted to get Milt's uh, thoughts about Matt Dunnigan's beard, this 
season. Had a lot of thought, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about like drama with the CFL panel and all that stuff. Wanted to talk with Milt about that. Really appreciate that. And then Sarah Saeed uh, came on the show. I really appreciate Sarah with the parlay. Sarah is one of the new kind of upstarting breed of these uh, great female voices on Twitter in the CFL media. Obviously, we had Danielle Ponticelli on last week. Christina Constable, I would include in that as well. Uh, love getting diverse opinions that way coming on. Sarah is young, doing lots of things, trying to engage the fan base that way. I think that that's really helpful to kind of like elevate the CFL here, you know, in 2022, try to get more people involved, you know, gambling online, kind of all that stuff. So really appreciate Sarah uh, taking the time to come on. And then Simone Eli, uh, tremendous, tremendous interview this week. Simone has been covering all of the drama down in Mobile, Alabama for the MLFB. Uh, recounts everything. Simone was there on site when the players, I'm not laughing because of it's a horrific situation, just laughing at just the craziness of the world that we live in. But Simone was there when the players were getting locked out of their hotels. Simone has had you know, correspondence with Frank Murtha, other people in the MLFB staff talking through all of that, you know, the financing being shut down. Is this season ever happening? Spoiler, it's not. But, uh, you know, 30 plus minutes, I think, with Simone just uh, really taking Frank Murtha and the rest of the MLFB uh, to task. Really appreciate Simone coming on, and I think you guys will enjoy that. Uh, as always, like and subscribe. Uh, should have uh, I have a couple of great guests. I'm lining up the next couple of weeks. And you know, if you ever want to hear of anybody specifically, I posted on Twitter this week. Yeah, you, know, you can always send me a message, send me an email. Happy to reach out to people. I have some great guests lined up. But yeah, you know, always looking for more suggestions. If you guys have players or you know staff, I know Brian Woods is always the top of the list. But you know, we're working on all of that stuff uh, through the various different uh, alt football PR league uh, PR departments, trying to get all of that stuff. Uh, check back at the end of the show. I'll have a quick outro. We had our giveaway uh, for the O Canada with the Mike Mitchell XFL stuff. Talk through all that at the end of the show. Like and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks. Well, I am not purposely, but I am drinking a Zoa right now as we talk. I have Greg Parks on, one of my dear friends and idols. I tweeted out today. I'm excited <laughs> for that. Uh, with X- you set the bar very high, Reed. You set the bar very high. No, that's but that's good. XFLboard.com. Greg Parks here. Uh, you know, one of my favorite people, honestly, to talk to about you know wrestling is like. I'm, you know, I'm sure you have a million people asking you your opinions on that. And then XFL stuff here as we go. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Reed. It looks like you're doing great as well. Uh, we're yeah, we're trying to stay cool. I was gonna put a shirt, another shirt on, and then you you hopped on, and we're we're riding now. It's it's warm here. It's warm for Seattle, but uh, we're outside. We're living life. It's not as hot as it was. Uh, it was 110 in Arizona, and then it was 103 in Dallas when I was there. So definitely better wow. than that. It looks beautiful. Thank you. So <laughs> we, I, I think it was a year ago, right? Like last week that we had you on the first time I had my Facebook mm-hmm. memories pop up and I said, you know, nothing's happened with the <laughs> XFL. We need to get Greg Parks on because we've been pushing and pushing. Now a lot of stuff has happened with the XFL. Uh, obviously we had Mike on last week, had a big talk with that. I said, I need to get Greg's thoughts on that. Plus I want to talk, you know, obviously your thoughts on the hub and the cities now that we have all that for sure. And then also the, the player pay and structure kind of versus the U.S. USFL, because that all came out last week. I think it was lost in a lot of the Arlington news, like what the XFL is going to do. So we'll cover all of that today. Uh, first off, Greg, how do you feel now? Like everything's out. The elephant is, you know, the the air has been let out of the balloon. Like we know what's going on now. Well, it feels better. You know, you had that, it was sort of a cloud lingering over everything because there was a real palpable sense among a lot of fans of, okay, what went wrong? Why aren't we getting these cities? You know, the, the, that sense of dread that as an XFL fan, you have built into you just because of the way that the league has gone the previous two incarnations. Uh, and, and so that's, that's out. Um, you know, you still have the situation with Las Vegas and the stadium that needs to be worked out. And perhaps that's the reason the league waited as long as they realistically could to announce the cities. They wanted to try to get that stadium deal uh, worked out. Ultimately, they couldn't. They had to announce something. I mean, they were really getting down to the time where, where they had to get this stuff out there, if only to start the season ticket deposits, which is going to be very important. So, 
you know, that that's still a situation that's got to be cleared up. We don't really know what the holdup is on that, but we can just assume based on the stadium situation in Las Vegas that there is some snag in the negotiations with Allegiant Stadium, which is where the Las Vegas Raiders of the NFL play. And it's really you know, by most accounts, the only realistic option in Las Vegas for the Las Vegas XFL team to play. So, it, you know, that, that does give Allegiant Stadium a lot of leverage when you've already announced Las Vegas. But I just think the XFL had pushed these announcements out so far that that was that was their limit. They had to announce the cities um, and they had to get them out there, even if they didn't have the stadium situation in Las Vegas squared away yet. Yeah, the timing made sense. You know, the showcases we wrapped up. I was hoping just from like a selfish standpoint, we'd get a little bit in between the showcases, but it made sense. We did all six. We did those in more neutral locations, not to give away any of the stuff. I don't, the, the Vegas thing, I talked with Mike about it last week too. Like I wouldn't live and die with being in Vegas to really have to be all beholden on them now and what they decide in terms of what the agreements are going to be. Like I think San Diego, I think a lot of other you know people are talking Ohio. So I just think there were other options that, I mean, do you feel like Vegas is that strong of a market? I mean, obviously uh, WWE goes there now, Allegiant, they have the big loop there, but is that, that worthwhile? of a market? Uh, it, it doesn't seem to me to be that way. And so I'm not sure what went into the decision-making process that led them to Las Vegas as a city. Um, you know, with the XFL's deal with Arlington, they do have a smidgen of leverage in that they could say, okay, if we don't get the deal we're looking for from Allegiant Stadium, we'll just play this year's Las Vegas home games in Choctaw Stadium. Because they've already, I know, I know, they've already got things set up there. But, I mean, that is kind of a fallback last resort type of option, I think, uh, because they, they have that deal with Arlington where the, you know, Arlington is the hub, the home base of XFL operations, home base of training camps and, and things like that. So they do have that in their back pocket. If they want to use that again, that's probably an absolute last resort, especially with all the other cities playing in their home stadiums. I'm really going to have an egg on my face because I tweeted yesterday after brunch. We had some mimosas. There's the new Tiger Woods meme where, with John Daly where it's yeah. He's with I saw him. I saw that tweet of yours. Yes, yeah. And I said, you know, uh, XFL. You know, we're playing in eight cities in the USFL or two to four. You know, hubs. I'm really going to be egg on my face if the XFL has to move one of the cities back to the hub. That would be. It's like the reverse USFL. Yeah, and again, you know, we we don't really know the details of the negotiations with presumably Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. We don't know if it's something that really is substantial and that would really lead the XFL to trying to find an alternate location for the team, at least for this year, or if it's just kind of I's haven't been dotted, T's haven't been crossed yet, and they they didn't want to officially announce anything until all that was wrapped up. So assuming, you know, and I, we've had debates on the podcast for the last two weeks about, you know, is it Legion or Sam Boyd or they can't play at Sam Boyd because they have an agreement with Legion. So assuming Vegas gets worked out, because I would hate for them to come out tomorrow and say like, hey, we're playing in the Legion or whatever. Uh, you know, we know the eight cities, right? Seattle, Vegas, the three in Texas, St. Louis, D.C., Orlando. Now that it's all out in the blue, do you think that that is a good swath covering of this of the United States, even with the Texas Triangle located, you know, in there? I I, I don't know what the purpose of the cities was. I don't know if it was, and I think Danny Garcia had made mention in one of her statements that they the league really took their time in looking into what cities were um, sort of deserving, I guess, of an XFL franchise. I think the biggest, um, you know, you, you don't have LA and New York, which is, a, it, it's a problem. I, I don't know how big of a problem it's going to be. I think sometimes that gets a little blown out of proportion, but I think that is um, something to have a conversation about if we're talking about the locations of these cities, but you also have the Northeast that's not really covered at all. I mean, you have DC that's close. Um, you know, so it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's great. I think that the three cities in Texas kind of have prevented 
the XFL from getting a bigger footprint across the the entirety of the lower 48 anyway. Um, but that's, you know, if they have their eye on expansion, which we've heard ownership talk about at different points uh, since they've taken over, they, they seem to really want to be aggressive in terms of expansion if uh, the, the financial realities of the league allow in the next two or three years. So it wouldn't surprise me if in, in three years, the league uh, looks very different in terms of the, their footprint across the United States. I always laugh where it's like, you know, we, we really spent a lot of time looking at these cities, but, except we don't have the venue locked up in Vegas, like, but we've really spent a lot of time. Like, it's always just, it was the same thing when they, Danny was on that Sportico interview and she said, we have all these great ideas, like, we just cannot wait to share them. And then they come up with the logo and it was, you know, kind of <laughs> like, I, you know, it's the same here. Like, we have really meticulously researched whatever the venues we want to be in, yet we don't have a stadium agreement to play. And when now we're, it's, all of our luck 2020 again where we've announced that we're, <laughs> we've announced the cities right I, if i'm remembering that correctly right like he announced and then it was like oh now they got to deal with metlife and stuff because the agreements weren't weren't all in place right that was um i think that came out in the lawsuit with yeah. vince mcmahon that oliver luck had and i don't know if it was i don't know if he had actually announced just the cities or the venues too without um, having the deal in place. I think he had actually announced the venues without the deal in place, which which is what gave the venues the leverage. Um, we, we haven't reached that point yet. I mean, uh, the thing you could say is at least uh, the XFL ownership has learned something from um, Oliver Luck's missteps in 2020 that they didn't actually announce Allegiant Stadium before they had any kind of deal. Yeah, that is wild. <laughs> like we're, play- we're playing in MetLife, and then they're like, wow, okay, now you are going to pay a lot more to play here than you yeah. have a week ago. So, you know, obviously, USFL hasn't been as high on your radar. I mean, tangentially with XFL and all that stuff, but, you know, everyone's aware of the issues, uh, challenges, if you will, that USFL had this season, you know, attendance, fans, local engagement, all of that. Uh, you know, I asked Danny and, and Russ and all that about it in Dallas knowing that they're going the same, you know, initial route, having the teams based in Arlington, but playing in the cities. Are you, do you feel like their game plan that they're going to maybe benefit, not have the same worries that the USFL had, or, or what do you think about them trying to do the hub, but like it's the modified hub we've learned from mistakes. I, I think the modified hub is a nice sort of middle ground between what the USFL is doing and what XFL 2020 did. And if it saves, the XFL a significant amount of money? Okay. Um, now that all is dependent upon that local engagement that you, you asked Andy Garcia about. And I think uh, the XFL realized that that is something that people were going to question because in the press release that was put out by the XFL uh, that named Arlington the home city and gave all the details, there was a line in there, I think from Danny Garcia, about the XFL's plan to keep those local cities in the loop and to keep them engaged. So it was almost like they were coming out ahead uh, of what they knew was going to come, which was criticism either from people like us or the local cities themselves about, you know, how are you going to get these these fans engaged when the players are not living in the cities, when the coaches are not in the cities, when not practicing in the cities. So it seems like, and based on her comments to you, they do have some plans. Now, uh, obviously nothing concrete, nothing specific about those plans, but I think they, they do realize, and that was that was a good sign for me. And that gave me a little bit of a sigh of relief to see that in the press release and hear her talk to you about it is they recognize that importance because I think XFL 2020 did just an absolutely fantastic job of the team presidents getting out in those communities. You know, you had uh, some teams that would set up booths at local high school football games and anything to get that brand out there and, and be recognized by people who would be most apt to attend these games. And uh, the the burden now is on XFL 2023 to uh, do the same thing or, or to do something in those communities to be recognized as a, um, as a franchise that, you know, people will want to go out and support. I do in Seattle here, we do the Seattle wedding show where obviously we're like the videography sponsor for weddings, but uh, that same, it was, so it would have been November of 2019 we did the Northwest event show, which is a way more corporate and they have like tour vans and, you know, event planners, all this stuff. They had like a Seattle dragons booth in the event show. (laughs) I mean, it was like, they were everywhere. I mean, it really was. And and that, that wasn't a cheap, 
I'm trying to think. I mean, it was probably four or five thousand bucks to get a booth there to run that to be able to hand that stuff wow. off. Like, I mean, this is these are investments that were made. It's weird to me that we're you know we're we're keeping the players in the hubs. We're saving money. I understand. That. I understand the concept. But then like Russ and Danny and they've said like, well, we're going to have staff in the markets, right? We're going to have people there. Yeah. So I'm like, so so we're like some people are living. We're not having the players live. It's. I mean, I guess you're still any money saved is money saved, but it just seems weird that like we're still going to have people there working, but not necessarily the players. Yeah, that's certainly a good thing to have boots on the ground. I think is the phrase that was used in the the press conference in those cities. I think you you absolutely have to have that to have any kind of relationship and to have any kind of serious marketing and advertising in those cities. You have to have somebody or a group of people there representing that team, a staff in place. You know, there's been lots of discussion online about where the money saving is going to come from when you have to fly out all the teams on the weekends instead of just housing them. There is did they get a sweetheart deal in the hotels and housing the players as opposed to you know having to find housing for the players in these individual cities? Um, is it insurance based reasons? Uh, you know, workers comp based reasons to have them all in Texas? So uh, there, there's just so many potential avenues for the XFL to save money uh, by being based in Texas and basing the players in Texas that we may not even be considering. Um, you know, if it was not a money saving deal, I'm not sure why the XFL would do it. So, you know, it has to be, even though maybe Danny Garcia and, and Russ Brandon would not admit it, uh, that has to be the reason they're saving money somehow doing it there. I would love, you know, if anyone ever wants to come on and explain where these cost savings are coming from, I would certainly love that. Do you, from a competitive, and I've I've gotten a lot of this on the call-ins and seen this on Twitter, like the, the competitive disadvantage, obviously we had Birmingham and they had the home field and the, the fans and all that stuff was made a lot of with the USFL. But, you know, if you're the non-Arlington teams, you're traveling or flying Every, I mean, nine out of 10 or, I mean, w- once the schedule comes out, we can count it up, but you're traveling to significantly a lot more. It feels like than than maybe the Arlington based team. I mean, they're moving around, but every other team it's, they're traveling every weekend. Do you worry about the competitive advantage there? Sure. And I think that's the second of the two real concerns I had about doing this kind of hub. The first being, you know, just not being in those cities and and perhaps losing out on some marketing opportunities, but also the competitive disadvantage that teams like Seattle and DC will face. And, you know, I think the XFL tried to make it as, um, equal as possible. I mean, they're in Texas, but they're in the central time zone. So, you know, if you're flying to Seattle, it's only, I think, an hour or two, one direction. And in, in, in D.C., it's an hour in the other direction. So it's not like they're based on the East Coast and forcing teams to fly out to the West Coast and a significant time change. So it does seem like they're trying to be centralized in terms of where the teams are as well. But absolutely, I mean, I don't know how you can argue against the potential for a competitive disadvantage, especially for the Arlington team, you know, to a lesser extent, the other Texas teams, San Antonio and Houston, but certainly, you know, Seattle, DC, Orlando, uh, St. Louis are going to be the ones that that are going to have to travel a lot more often. And so that could be problematic. You know, I, I think that you won't see coaches use that as an excuse because that was something that I'm sure was discussed as they were brought on board and they were okay with it. So, um, that it's not like something that was sprung upon them the last minute, same with the players, you know, they're all going to know what they're getting into when they sign on with the league. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I, I hope it's not as big of a deal as we sort of think it might be, but it is something to consider. I would just love to know like what came first here, chicken or the egg, like was the XFL, were they doing the Arlington hub and did they turn on that first week of USFL games? And they were like, Oh my God, like we can't, like, I just, I want to know because Mike reported and then, and then it came back and then it was just modified and we still, that's kind of what we've all lived with, right? For the last few months is okay. Somehow they're doing this modified, but I would just love to know like the steps in which that was like, did they turn on that second game and we're like, this is, we can't. Yeah. You know, I don't know how you could have been surprised by that though. Uh, that was something that I was, I was waving that flag very early on when the USFL announced, you know, we're doing this single city hub. And I said, that's going to look terrible on TV. Like, and, and when you're a, an organization like the USFL that is trying to get their foothold in, in the audience and trying to 
be legitimate in the eyes of fans who are already casting a doubting eye on, you know, secondary football leagues, spring football leagues, whatever you want to call it, you know, for them to tune in and their first impression of the USFL is playing in a, in a stadium in front of a couple hundred people, maybe uh, that's not a good signal. And you saw the reaction from Twitter. I know you saw the reaction from people who didn't know about the USFL playing in a hub and, and saying, you know, what kind of uh, Mickey Mouse organization is this? And so, you know, that's, that's something that I saw coming and I, and I can't believe that the people in charge of the XFL would have been surprised by how bad that came across on TV to people. I think a lot of people were really surprised. I mean, I think like, yeah. I know you're saying like, I, I mean, I remember having conversations. I think we had uh, Roy S. Johnson. He was one of the guys with the AL.com that was there and uh, kind of covering all the city stuff. And he goes, well, you know, we'll probably get like 20, 22 for the Birmingham and then maybe like 10, 12, 15 for the non-Birmingham game. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm like, okay, I, I, I trust all that. And it, not to, to belabor the point, but uh, I don't know. I think something had to switch there because it seemed to me like even uh, the, the Daryl uh, Moose Johnson was saying like, well, it, it was even worse than we thought it was going to be. I mean, I don't think that anyone expected 50 people at, at – uh, Yeah, and – and that's another advantage that the XFL is going to have. And I don't know what the USFL's hub situation is going to look like. I know there's a couple balls up in the air, it seems like, on that. They, they – could potentially move to a two or four city hub just as easily as they could stay in the, the one city hub next year. So, uh, you know, again, the advantage, and I think I've talked about this on, on here before is the XFL is going to be playing in front of 20, 30,000 fans in those home cities before the XF uh, before the USFL plays a second season. And so the onus is now on the USFL to kind of respond and say, okay, we don't want, it, it was a bad look last year. It's going to, look even worse now with the XFL, which is our main competition, going out and having uh, their games in front of sizable crowds that we would expect sitting here. So um, I, that may push the USFL into doing something different. I don't know. I really go back and forth. I, I I think both leagues have tremendous, there's pros and cons and USFL going first. And you know, I always thought, okay, XFL is going to lay in the way, learn all these mistakes. I still think that I think USFL, we had Ben Fisher on a couple weeks ago talking like, hey, when it comes to season two, they can talk to advertisers and go, these are the games that we're doing. These are the ad Mm -hmm. rates we have. This is everything like... You know, it, it's easier to pitch. It was like when I was trying to get into weddings and you're like, I got to go film something. And even if it's a really bad wedding, you know, really cheap wedding, like at least now I have something I can sell and use that to kind mm-hmm. of get in more people. Where the XFL, it, you know, I, I, I go back and forth. I was incredibly bullish leaving um, the, the Arlington announcement last Monday, having talked with everyone there. Uh, where do you fit right now in, in between both leagues and your thoughts? There are certainly some advantages uh, to waiting a year and certainly a lot of disadvantages. And I think you brought up uh, one of the, the important advantages that the USFL has is they could say, hey, this is what we drew. This is what you can expect and, and charge ad rates based on that. The XFL could cite XFL 2020 numbers, but you know that's three years ago by the time they kick off. And a lot changes in uh, television in three years. And so you know, I don't know if you can still point to that, even though a lot of the cities are the same, even though the game, uh, by the sounds of it, is going to look very similar to what it looked like in 2020. I'm not sure how relevant those ratings uh, back then were. Um, you know, certainly the ESPN machine being behind the XFL will be important. But uh, the other thing that I think was advantageous to the XFL and just seeing how the USFL did things, and I know we're going to talk about this a little later, is the contract setup. Right. So the XFL could kind of see what kind of contracts the USFL was offering, what the pay was, and they could kind of set their rate based on that. Now, it's a little different because XFL season one is is basing theirs on USFL season one when USFL season two contracts could look a little different. Um, But the the way the seasons run are also going to be advantageous to the XFL because we know 
that the USFL has in their contract that they will let players out to play in the NFL, but are not going to do so to let them play in the XFL. The XFL doesn't really have to worry about that because by the time their season ends, the USFL is going to be two, three, four weeks into their season. And what player is going to go from, you know, training camp in January all the way through early May, a season and jump right into playing more games for the USFL rather than trying to find work in the NFL. So I, I don't think really that's something contractually the XFL is necessarily going to have to worry about people trying to leave their league and jump into the USFL. But given the distance between the USFL offseason and the next season of the XFL, that is something that, and we've seen it based on how they structure their contracts, something that the USFL probably is concerned about. That's actually really fascinating. I never thought about that. And I've had a lot of, um, and we'll get into the player pay here, I guess, too, because that makes sense timing wise. Uh, you know, we had uh, Rod Woodson during the Arizona Player Showcase. I was asking him USFL and all that stuff, and him saying, "Yeah, the, the way USFL has structured their contracts is not really player friendly. It's more league friendly, which obviously I understand. They need to mm-hmm. do, you know, their job. But like you said, the XFL, if you get out in April, you could go do the NFL thing, all that, be out, and still come back and do the XFL again in, in you know, if you're cut or don't make it or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, in, in December, where they don't they don't really have competition. I, I know that the, there was some verbiage, and maybe we can talk about it in the article, that the XFL, you're not under contract until, like, training camp start or whatever, that even if you're drafted, you can still go. But it doesn't seem like they're worried about that. Does that seem weird that the XFL – isn't worried at all about USFL maybe sniping. The XFL isn't releasing their uh, their showcase lists, right, presumably to keep them protected. But yet mm-hmm. you could draft somebody in November, and then the USFL could come in and take them in, in their league. Right. The problem then, of course, is you know if you sign with the USFL rather than the XFL, you have to wait a lot longer mm-hmm. to play a season. Right, because the USFL starts well after the XFL season starts, and if you're a football player, you know the more downtime you have, it can be disadvantageous to you. Um, so I, I think from that point of view, plus the idea of you know, and, and Doug Whaley made mention of this on the Zoom call that you know there might be players that they offer contracts to prior to the draft if there is competition from the USFL. So they certainly recognize that the USFL is after the same batch of players that the XFL is after, and so I think. They, they could offer, we know that they'll offer contracts to quarterbacks who they're going to work with in the uh, months leading up to the draft. A couple times a, a month is, is something new that the XFL is implementing that they didn't have in 2020. But, um, you know, there also could be higher level players that they're able to attract that they would want to get under contract early on prior to the draft so that the USFL does not nab them. So, so to kind of point our direction in this now. So Monday after, so it would be you know, last Monday following the Arlington announcement, Neil Stratton, who's with Inside the League, he hosted a call with uh, Doug Whaley, who's the Senior Vice President of Player Personnel. And I would I would call him friend of the show, uh, Russ Giulio here, uh, Senior Director of Player Administration and Officiating, to talk about player contracts, the roster size, pay, all that stuff. Uh, things that stood out to you, I know that uh, we, I, I think Mike Mitchell had his tweet thread here, but obviously you have your big article here talking about all this stuff. Uh, things that stood out from you that you saw from the Zoom call. Well, any kind of difference um, in XFL 2023's execution of the contracts and the rosters and all of that stuff versus XFL 2020 is going to stand out. So, like I said, the idea is to, you know, it, it's going to be a league that, um, rises and falls on quarterback play, just like any secondary league is going to. And I think the personnel people recognize that. And Doug Whaley mentioned signing um, certain quarterbacks, if they can, before the draft, working uh, with a quarterback guru a couple times a month leading up to training camp. Uh, Mini camp will just be uh, quarterbacks, receivers, running backs, the skill position players on offense, because they know that quarterbacks and offense are going to drive interest in this league. And they want them to be as prepared as possible. Once the league starts, we've seen with the XFL in not only 2001, but 2020 as well, where the quarterbacks who started the season, even after a full month of training camp and, and mini camp, we've seen those starting quarterbacks ineffective and replaced within the first couple 
of weeks. And I think the league would rather not have to go through that quarterback carousel. They'd rather have um, pretty well-established names and starters and, and have them ready to execute at a high level once the regular season starts. So that stood out to me. Uh, the other piece that stood out to me too is, and this was almost an aside by Doug Whaley, but having the draft in mid-November couldn't give a date because they were waiting on their television partners. And so we know that the XFL 2020 draft was very low budget. It was basically done uh, via conference call that they did have it, I think, on a streaming on YouTube at the time. Um, I listened to that as much as I could during uh, during school. During my planning period, I just cranked it up a little, a lot, a little louder. Um, but it seems as if there's interest from ESPN in broadcasting this. Now, we don't know. It could be ESPN+. Plus. It's not necessarily going to be on the mothership, ESPN. Um, but even that is a significant departure from XFL 2020 and will allow them to get their foot in the door a little bit and really give them probably their first opportunity to put on any kind of televised event for this version of the XFL. So we can kind of see how they're planning to um, – have the the structure and, and what the what a, what a televised XFL event is going to look like. We'll get a sneak peek of that perhaps in November. So those are the two things that that really jumped out to me. No Team Nine uh, as they had in, in 2020, which you know, given the the desire to save money, is not really a surprise. They'll have free agents in for workouts during the week, similar to what NFL teams do during the regular season. So that's another change from XFL 2020. But those are the big things that jumped out to me. Well, the Team 9 thing, you know, I always thought USFL needed to do that, and they, they never did uh, what, like, the XFL is doing where – we're just going to have guys here training, you know, practicing kind of in the hub. We're all in the hub. Uh, it, crazy to me that USFL is like, oh, crap, our quarterback went down. Like, we got to bring in someone. It's like, you're all in you're all in Birmingham. Like, how do you not just have yeah. people, like, working out? I think the ESPN thing is going to be fascinating. I was going to mention that earlier, too, just how you know people have been waiting. You know, we're, we're wanting the hype. They've bought. Like, we're all waiting. We're all waiting. Once, you know, it was like the ESPYs, Jimmy Kimmel. You know, it seemed like once ESPN now, we had the HBCU showcase, right? Deion Sanders. All, like, mm -hmm. once ESPN was ready to, like, talk about XFL, we're, all, like, ready to talk about it now. Like, we're going. Yeah. I think the draft is huge. I think that was one of the biggest mistakes the USFL had. Um, I remember, I can't, the, the impressions I got on that tweet when I had the comment back from the league, like, we have no plans to broadcast or stream or do anything, was crazy. Because, you, you know, here you're trying to attract this niche market. It's like, no, like we're not, you know, stay away, stay away. We're here. You're going to put it on ESPN. The chances of bringing in, even if you're only going to broadcast that first couple rounds, like, I don't think we need to go through round eight and like, okay, who is the <laughs> secondary, you know, like linebacker that we're bringing? But Getting some of those big names on the ESPN too. I mean, I see some of the stuff that's on there during the weekday. Like, I think you could carve out two hours <laughs> for the XFL. Sure, and you know, it, it's from the USFL's perspective. You know, not streaming it or anything. It, it can't have cost much to just even put it on YouTube, like the XFL did. So, um, like you said, it's a it's a niche market, and there are a lot of people um, who are interested in that sort of thing. Why not throw them a bone? You know, if it's not going to cost you much. So, yeah, the, the ESPN part is very interesting, uh, and it also gives an opportunity because these players may not be players that are household names to a lot of football fans, and it gives those football fans an opportunity to perhaps meet some of these players for the first time. If I'm a fan in St. Louis, and I know the Battlehawks, or, or whatever they're going to be called, are going to be playing in St. Louis, you know, I might want to tune in so that I can put a face to a name, so I can put a story to a name that I'm going to be seeing when I attend the games in the Dome in, in uh, February. This is interesting. Like I, I, and I go back and forth. That you know, I always think Fox, USFL, right? Like Fox, they have everything, right? Like it's Fox Broadcasting. You know, we can film. We have all the equipment. We can bring in 55 cameras and drones and all that. Like. XFL is different. I had my Uber back to the airport with uh, some of the guys that do the social videos for seven bucks mm -hmm. or whatever. And it was interesting talking with them because I'm like, this, this isn't nearly right. What, their scale of what they're working on versus like what Fox is, right? You know, Fox and we're this nationwide or broadcast around the world. Like, mm -hmm. but these guys, like they know how to create content that people want to watch, right? That's going to drive interest. Like that's all they're doing yeah. is shooting stuff or TikTok and Instagram and building things to get interest. Like, 
I think sometimes having people, idea thinkers like that in your organization would lead you to be like, we need to do more with the draft. We need to do more with these things. Whereas Fox is like, well, we're not going to put that on prime time at eight. So we're not like, we don't care about that. I don't know. It just seems like they get it more. It's definitely a different mentality when you're talking about a production company like Seven Bucks versus a gigantic network like Fox, and and especially with Danny Garcia and The Rock, who you know that's their production company, and they're also owners of the XFL. So you know it's kind of it, it's in their best interest to uh, get the league out there and get it known. Whereas Fox has seven thousand other tentacles to worry about within their division, let alone putting on a USFL draft on television so you know i think it's it's the red tape is a lot less going the way that the xfl is going through seven bucks at least for now you know we don't know if the xfl is going to be hiring their own um you know or or working with espn more in terms of production or or just going with seven bucks but um at least right now it's it's smaller certainly than the the um everything that Fox has at its disposal, but in some ways it might be easier that way. Yeah. Just a little more nimble. Hey, we want to put this on YouTube, the Texas yeah. live. We That's a good to- word for it. Yeah. Just more nimble. So rosters, 66 players going into training camps, uh, 50 for regular season active game day, active rosters will be 45. That is the, I guess I'm trying USFL was 38 and then moved up and then probably, I mean, it's similar game day rosters, right? Thoughts on the 45 players on that. Yeah. I compare it to XFL 2020, which I think was 52 man rosters and 45, 46 active on game day. So very similar in terms of the setup uh, again, no team nine for free agency. So you won't have those players pushed on to XFL rosters as you did just before the league shut down. Right. It, it, the deal was if you were practicing with team nine halfway through the season, they would cycle you on to XFL rosters and basically bring in a new team nine for the last half of the year. So they won't be that, although, you know, the deal with the NFL Alumni Academy will allow those players uh, that are in the academy at the end of the NFL season an opportunity in XFL training camps. Um, so, you know, again, no, no surprise with the rosters. Um, 66 in camp seems pretty reasonable. Uh, they, they mentioned that they won't probably draft 66 players in November because, and this is another difference from XFL 2020, they plan on having two to three supplemental drafts in the coming months before training camp, which XFL 2020 only had one. So I think a lot of that's going to be dependent upon, you know, what are the level of players who are seeking XFL contracts after the draft leading up to training camp? Do you have guys who, you know, are being cycled on and off NFL rosters who at some point say, you know, I'm tired, I'm tired of working out for NFL teams and not getting a contract. Let me just go to the XFL and play and earn some money that way. So toward the end of the NFL season, you may have players who make that decision as well. And they would go into the supplemental draft. Um, So they're, they're not really planning on having quote unquote free agency uh, leading up to the draft. It's not like, you know, you'd be, uh, you know, Orlando would sign a player to, to pad out their training camp roster. It sounds like the supplemental drafts will be where those uh, supplemental players come from. Well, that's different because USFL, they're already signing. Like, they're already bringing people into mm-hmm. the draft for next year and the uh, signing free agents. Yeah, so USFL, they went from 38 to 40, and then the total roster was 45 to 50 with the, you know, with those, the active what players on that uh, contracts that they're playing uh, getting paid 59,000 per year. USFL was 45, uh, 5,000 per game win bonus of a thousand per player. Players get 800 per week training camp. So all slightly more. I think USFL was uh, 600. Don't quote me uh, training yep. camp. Uh, and then uh, about 45 a, a year minus uh, food and housing, which they had to pay for uh, XFL. It seems like they're covering a lot of those meals and stuff. And it was weird, like three meals, mm-hmm. a snack. And then during the season, <laughs> they're only going to get like uh, thoughts on, on that. Cause, cause that to me is the big difference is like XFL didn't come out and say like, we're paying six figures per player, right? Like we're paying mm-hmm. slightly more than the USFL where they kind of set the base mark last year. Yeah, and the fifty nine thousand I think is kind of the average player when you take into account they're getting paid five thousand dollars a week, eight hundred dollars for the five weeks of training camp, and then whatever win bonuses come, you know that would probably average out to about fifty nine thousand as as the base. And you know those quarterbacks that we talked about earlier, they're going to get more, um, probably significantly more. So um, they did mention, and I didn't put this in the article, but um, Doug Whaley and, and Russ Giglio did mention that. 
you know, these, these contracts are not negotiable. Like they're, they're not looking for agents to come in and say, Hey, I have this guy with five years of NFL experience. Can you bump up the pay? It doesn't sound like there's going to be a lot of room for negotiation. Now, whether or not, you know, the, the XFL can, can nab a player and say, you know, it's, I'll compare it to what the XFL did in 2020 with Antonio Callaway, right? They gave him a big hundred thousand dollars signing bonus instead of adding to the salary. So maybe that's a way that the XFL can get around um, not negotiating the contracts. They may give signing bonuses to players who uh, have extensive NFL experience and want to try their hand at the XFL. So, um, you know, that's kind of to be determined. I don't know how much uh, room there is to, to add on to salary like that. But uh, yeah, it's slightly more, I would say in, in all ways than the USFL. But again, you know, if, if you compare it to USFL 2023, that may be the more apt comparison uh, because players right now, that's what they're going to have to decide between. They're going to de- decide between not what the USFL already paid, but what they will be paying versus what the XFL will be paying. And um, I don't know that the USFL has come out and said any changes in their contract structure, but you know, if they're going to be competing for players with the XFL toward the end of NFL training camp, it would behoove them to come out and say, Hey, you know, this is what we're going to be offering next year. So the players and agents have something to compare to. This is interesting. You're going to run into this, like, you know, cause the players that are already signed are on two year contracts. That contract, if it was like before midway through the season, you had the NFL opt out clause. Then at the second half of the season, the contract reverted back to a USFL contract. Then we're going to have players this next year that are going to be signed. Like right, uh, the like the generals they're signing free agents, so presumably that's still under the forty five thousand. And that's you know as as a as a player personnel nerd, um, that's very interesting to me because you know they're signing contracts with the league. So, and they will, I assume the USFL will hold another draft next year. So what determines whether or not a player goes into the USFL draft versus gets signed as a free agent? Like if you're signing a USFL contract, in my mind, you should be going into the draft. So are they, you know, so I I don't know how that works. That's interesting to me to see these teams signing players. Um, And then you're wondering, okay, what's going to happen with the draft? The one advantage that the USFL does have timing wise, and we saw a couple players take advantage of this last year is the USFL starts after, uh, I believe, the NFL draft or right around that time. So that's when the XFL season is ending. So they're not going to be able to take players who were not drafted, who were not signed as rookie free agents and who want to play, they're not going to be able to sign those guys. Whereas the USFL, it's almost perfect timing for them. If I'm a player who didn't get drafted, uh, maybe got a tryout at rookie minicamp, but didn't get signed, I may say, let me latch on with the USFL team here for the rest of the season and see if I can get signed um, before training camp starts. And so that, I think that's the one place that the USFL does have an advantage in terms of, of getting players who are not drafted that same year. Well, yeah, because then and then they would be locked into the USFL for two years if they keep their contracts yep. the same. That they wouldn't revert that. Uh, you know, now that we're seeing and and I'm pleasantly happy to see a lot of USFL guys get signed to the NFL. Right, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kavante Turpin did the Cowboys one. I know there's there's been a lot of uh, like people trying out and then and then the signings and all that. Um, uh, commanders, I think, have three, which I'm happy about. The Washington Commanders, my team, they've got five XFL players on their team too. We're really, so they, they've they've gone really hard into the alternative leagues to find players. Uh, well, we need to bolster up Carson Wentz. It's like anything we can do. We really need to like. <laughs> it's like Roman Reigns, right? Like we got to fill. Yeah. We got to really. We got we got this weak a weakness. We got to fight. Um, better time of year now that we're even talking contracts and all that February to April XFL or April to July USFL given everything kind of we know now. Yeah, I still think it's February to April. Um, and, uh, I think the first week of May actually is when the, um, XFL championship game is slated to take place. And, That's another point that Doug Whaley and Ross Giglio made on the call is that the end of the XFL season will dovetail right into NFL's phase two off season, which phase one is just conditioning. And obviously these players would not need to go through that having just gone through 10 weeks of an NFL season. But, you know, this is when you start getting into the playbook and getting into things like that. So it it dovetails perfectly for XFL players to get in a full off season work with an NFL team, as opposed to kind of just 
you know, getting on at the end of a roster um, in in July. That being said, I have been impressed with the number of USFL players who've been signed to NFL rosters. I was one of those who was concerned about the um, the the time of year that the USFL decided to play, and I thought that would be prohibitive of a, a lot of players getting opportunities in the NFL. But I've been pleasantly surprised at how many players have ended up signing with NFL teams. And I mean, and we don't, I mean, we don't know how many are going to stick, right? I mean, I don't wish ill right. will. I mean, obviously these are all signed. It's just, I mean, I remember last year, uh, you know, Cole Boozer got signed to the commanders, was on the field for 10 minutes and then, then retired. Like they, you know, I mean, this can, they, I mean, you can have yeah. things happen, but I like, obviously the, the Kavante Turpin one and a couple of the others, like the really stand out. I think Chris Odom is still uh, weighing his um, options at this point where he wants to go. But yeah, I mean, not all of them will latch on, but I am glad because I was afraid it was going to be like, uh, there's no more chairs at the yeah musical yeah. chairs. Like we're all out of chairs here. We don't for have sure. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts, anything? I mean, we've been going 45 minutes. I don't want to keep you forever, but just any other thoughts you want to get on uh, the contracts, XFL, anything else? Um, I don't think so. Uh, you know, obviously the next thing that we're going to be looking at now is uh, team names and, and things like that. And there's going to be, I know there's going to be a lot of consternation from XFL fans if if the league goes in a different direction with some of the team names or even the, the colors or um our logo. So just be prepared for that, uh, that reaction on Twitter, but you know, the, the XFL logo that came out and I'm warming to it. I, I didn't like it at first. I'm still not a huge fan of it, but I'm getting more used to it. Um, you know, I, I think that gives a lot of fans pause about, Ooh, if this is what they're coming up with for the league logo, what are they going to come up with for the teams? You know, that sort of thing. So, um, that's something you hope comes out soon because just like needing to get the cities out there so they can start taking season ticket deposits, you, you want to start getting the, the logos and colors out there so you can start selling merchandise. I mean, that's, that's easy money to make on the uh, XFL shop website. So, you know, the sooner you get that out, the, the more money you can make on that. So hopefully that comes out soon. Soon, and then we, you know, continue to see players uh, get draft invites, and you know, potentially have another showcase in October. Uh, Thirteen hundred players ended up on the wait list for showcases, well, which was uh, said on the um, on the Zoom call, which is just it's mind boggling that that many players have have an interest in playing in the XFL. So they are looking to do another uh, showcase around the time that they're doing the Nick Novak kicking showcase in October out in California. Um, so, you know, just, you know, continuing to track that, I have a new column up, uh, on, on, on Monday, uh, today when we're recording this on XFL board, where I'm starting to dig into, uh, the NFL team rosters and see what players could end up in the XFL. So make sure to take a look at that. I, I'll be getting more into that. Uh, part one is posted for AFC teams. Part two will be posted soon where I look at NFC teams. And then once the preseason starts and NFL teams put out their depth charts, uh, unofficial as they may be, I'll start looking at XFL. NFL players who are in the NFL, players who played in 2020 who are in the NFL, see what their chances of, of making the teams are based on where they sit on the depth charts early in, uh, early in training camp. So still a lot I have coming out on XFL board and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to, to write things up as more things come out. But, um, you know, it's that, that whole city thing was just kind of a load off everybody's shoulders, I think. And, and it's, it, it de gave a definite feeling of, okay, now we can really move forward and, and have our eye toward the goal of February. Uh, you talk about them wanting to sell merchandise. I mean, haven't you already purchased like three or four of the like, I have not, I, I have not. Um, and you know, in 2020, the XFL did the same thing. They put out, um, uh, merchandise with the city before they had announced the team names. I, I don't remember exactly what the look was like. I don't know if it was comparable to what they're putting out on XFL shop these days, but uh, no, I, I, you know, if they, if they had a team in Naples, Florida, maybe I would be going out and getting one, but uh, no, I, I, I'll pass on that one. Yeah, it was better. Maybe I'll wear that. Maybe I'll dig that out. I'll wear that for my intro this week. I have the XFL Seattle one. I also oh, okay. have I also have a Seattle shirt signed by our forever quarterback Brandon Silver's number twelve on there. <laughs> I have that, but no, they were certainly better. I made the joke last week. Everyone, oh, I can't wait to see like Brock and Danny. They're going to revitalize. Like we're going to have a new vision for everything. And then it's like the worst shirts. Like they're just so. <laughs> uh, I the the logo is warming to me when you and I know you were at the showcase too when you're in the showcase 
and like all the coaches have like black and white in the hats. Like it felt very this is a real thing. Like it felt very yeah. like any given Sunday, like I'm watching the the sharks, yeah. right? Like I'm <laughs> it felt I don't know, it just felt very intimidating that all the coaches and everything. Obviously once the once they get their their colors, did you the, you know, the spoilers, right, that we have five of eight with the coaches with the colors behind them and then the three new ones. I mean, I'm kind of resigned to five of eight of the teams returning. How do you feel? You resigned to that. That makes it sound I, like you're not happy about it. Is there, no, happy, is there anyone? I, but yeah, okay. I, I, I've, I've come to accept that. I've come to a piece with the five of eight. Well, I hope so. I, I thought the branding was really strong in 2020 um, throughout the league. So if all five nicknames return if the color schemes all return even if the logos for legal reasons have to be changed on some of them like houston for example um you know that's that's a change that has to be made then and that's fine um so you know it it also does give the xfl sort of a template for the other three cities like you know it, it gives them okay these five teams are named this this is their color scheme you want the other three teams to blend in well with those names and teams um so it, it sort of gives them at least a baseline for uh what they should be seeking out when they're looking for team names for like las vegas and orlando and san antonio uh, what's your what's your vegas team name everyone has a vegas suggestion See, I'm I'm into the nostalgia, so give me Outlaws uh, from 2001. Like, I, I don't believe that's going to happen or anything like that, but it would be, you know, it, this is a league that I think would be wise to, it is what it is because of what's come before in, in a lot of ways. And granted, they were not successful by most traditional metrics. Um, but I think it would be, you know, you've got the, you've got the teams that are returning from 2020. You'd have the Las Vegas team returning from 2001 and you'd have two brand new teams that, um, you know, XFL 2023 puts their stamp on. So to have all three versions represented as teams would be really cool. But, you know, I also acknowledge that there were not a lot of people who liked XFL 2001 and especially liked the branding on 2001. That was definitely an acquired taste. So I could see that, you know, but I mean, outlaws would fit. You have renegades already. You have roughnecks. It would certainly be a team name that would fit with this version of the, of the league's branding. So yeah, give me outlaws. I think a hundred percent. I think it should be. The outlaws. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have them. I have a, I have a, he hate me Jersey in there or new old stock. I don't think, yeah, we can update the logo a little bit. Uh, it is yeah. funny when you talk about, you know, finally coming, the rock had the comment during that presser on Monday where he's like, well, you know, um, they, they tried before and we've learned like, we really think that like, we think this is the time it's going to work. And like, it didn't feel like super confident <laughs> rock. And I'm like, do you really feel that way? Like, <laughs> I, it just, it, it felt like, well, yes, this is like, we're very sure now that this is actually the best time to do well, it. Well, and you can kind of also understand, you know, the XFL is, is, is this version of it, especially is very forward looking. Right. I, I don't, I don't get a sense that they're looking back and even Oliver Luck in 2020, I know he was asked at one of the showcases about incorporating anything from 2001 into the league. And he was like, he was pretty nonplussed about that. He wasn't really like on board with that idea. And again, you can understand why, you know, you don't want to, uh, you want to differentiate that version from the league that failed not only failed, but failed in spectacular fashion. Um, so I, I think that might be one of those things that once, the XFL 2023 gets up and running and really gets a lot of forward momentum and they get to year two and they get to year three and they are financially solvent with TV deals or whatever the case may be. It might be a safer time to really look back nostalgically at even XFL 2020 and, and 2001. But I think certainly there's a lot of risk in doing that before you really have your, your foot in the ground. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know, I, I, I like the Outlaws, I like that. San Antonio, I think they have good. I think there'll be enough, however they announce it, I think there'll be enough. They bring back, we have the new teams, I think there'll be enough in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'll let you go here soon, I, I promise. I just, I, I, I want them, a lot of work to be done now. I've been thinking about this the whole uh, interview that you know, we've announced everything in August now, the NFL season, we have the Hall of Fame game this week. Like, NFL season is starting, so we need to, like, I mean, does Vegas know they have an XFL team? Like, does Seattle know the Dragons? Like, you know, my neighbor knows because I wear my hat. But like, we need to we need to start cultivating these fan bases now because I don't know I don't know what the buzz is like for the Seattle team right now. I think we need to start incorporating some local events here. 
sure. And you have a lot of these teams who are playing in cities that have NFL teams. And those fans tend to kind of turn off their brain to everything else in the sports world while the NFL season is going on. And I think that is also part of the reason why the XFL needed to announce their cities when they did before training camps got into full swing before everything was so nfl focused from not only espn their own television partner but really all other um sides of the sports media world they wanted to kind of get that out there and that's what's going to be interesting when you look at the logo reveals the jersey all of that kind of stuff that's going to be happening during the nfl season what kind of attention is the rest of the sports media going to give the xfl what kind of attention is their own broadcast partner going to give the xfl and the one thing i will say is the fact that they want to do the draft on an espn property is a good sign because that's going to be in november right in the um you know, the, the dog days of the NFL season. So the fact that ESPN is not, you know, the, the fact that ESPN is not turning off all things XFL during the NFL season is a good sign and gives me a little confidence that um, it, it's, it, you know, they're going to be a true partner with the XFL, not just when it's convenient for them. Well, and I'll, I'll criticize the same thing with Fox, where I think USFL has very much felt like an afterthought to Fox in terms of, well, we'll have some people do social media when we have time, and we'll work on these things. Like, yeah, ESPN needs to prioritize this if this is going to be one of your main mm-hmm. slates. You know, you got to... You got to do your homework here in the off season to get ready to build interest, you know, for when you need that property in February, March, April, you got to do a little bit of the legwork here uh, during the NFL season. Yeah. And the frustrating thing is we don't know any of the details about the financial arrangement between ESPN and the XFL. We do know that Danny Garcia was on record very early on as saying that, you know, that looking at a, a TV deal without significant income was not something they were looking at. We, we've seen Mike Mitchell's reporting um, that Redbird was not going to lift a finger on the league until they got a significant TV deal. And then lo and behold, they start moving forward. They start putting money into the league. ESPN is announced as a partner. One plus one equals two would tell you that ESPN is going to be paying a substantial amount. And that word was used in a recent article on The Athletic that talked about the um, potential merger already between the XFL and the USFL. Uh, I'm not ready to go there yet, but, um, you know, they had a source uh, presumably with the XFL that said that ESPN's financial investment in the XFL was substantial. So um, if that is the case, I mean, it's it's in ESPN's best interest to do as much as they can to prop up the XFL and get all the bang for their buck that they can uh well if you yeah if in just a spoiler here to wrap it up for next time if you if you enjoyed that article and the and the author that wrote that article you might want to check out the show next week could be a good could be a good tease Ooh. on that i'll figure that uh greg i'll let you go getting back to school here in the fall i'm sure you've been incredibly busy with all of the wwe and the vince mcmahon's and the summer oh, yeah. it, it's been a busy time for you has it not it has. Uh, this is the uh, sixth podcast I've done in the last week and a half, probably. Uh, I've written, uh, I have three articles waiting to be published for XFL board. I wrote three the weekend of the, the city reveal. So that's six plus my two uh, columns for the torch, pwtorch.com. And so I've, I've used this last week and a half as just kind of hunkering down and doing podcasts and doing writing. I go back to school on Wednesday. So uh, maybe even by the time people listen to this, I will have been back to school already. So um, trying to churn out as much content as I can before my attention is focused elsewhere. Well, I appreciate that very much, uh, Greg, you know, doing the Lord's work here. And yeah, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I need to get back into wrestling. It, it's a, now maybe that Vince is out. I, I really had a hard time kind of supporting that the last couple of years. So now yeah. that Vince and everything uh, certainly turned your world upside down. It, it did. And SummerSlam on Saturday night felt like the first show in a post Vince world. There were a lot of things on the show that, and, and, you know, you never really know how much you're reading too much into it as, as being post Vince, but there, there did feel like um, there were things on there that made you go, Hmm, I don't know if that would have been a Vince McMahon decision to make. So that gives people, I think some confidence that, you know, people like yourself who've, who've turned out, tuned out of the product, it's stale, you know, there's not a lot um, that, that attracts you to the product anymore, that maybe things will change. And so um, I think that's part of what WWE is banking on as well. And uh, thank God that the XFL and all this, that I don't think the XFL could have handled the Vince. I, I think that would have been bad. Yeah, you know, that's something that I do think about is um, had Vince either not 
taken the XFL into bankruptcy or purchased it out of bankruptcy like it seemed to be his intention, what would the fallout be? I mean, we would be, so we'd be 21 and 22. We'd probably be two more years into the league at this point. So you would hope that it would have grown enough roots to survive a post Vince world. But, you know, if if Vince isn't put and, and Vince stepped back from XFL 2020, he was, he was more the, the financial guy rather than the guy whose face was out there making the decisions. I mean, that was Oliver Luck. So maybe it would not have been as big of a deal because he was not out there at front and center, but it does certainly make you wonder what the fallout would be XFL wise from Vince. And it was always, it was always my thing too. I mean, Vince is, in his late seventies, what happened if he passed away? Would that spigot of money for the XFL have turned it off? I don't know. I don't know the, the machinations behind setting up his kind of shell corporation that he did to create the XFL and whether or not, you know, that would have been something that could have kept going um, with, with money getting put into it from, you know, if something had happened, but you know, that was a concern of mine too. When the XFL first started up is okay. What's our, what's our, what's our plan B if something happens to Vince here? Uh, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating sliding doors conversation. Greg, uh, thank you again for your time. I, I think the longest one of the interview here we've had today. So I certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. Reed. Thanks for having me on. Well, the last time I had this guest on, you almost walked off my show because I had a, a BC Lions jersey on. <laughs> so I've, I've borrowed my wife's. It's the University of Washington. But if you squint on the Zoom connection, it almost looks like a yeah. Winnipeg Blue Bomber hat. How are you doing in the Hall of Fame? <clears throat> Excuse me, Hall of Famer Milt Siegel. How are you? Man, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, we're almost midway through our season. Uh, there's been some ups and downs for CFL teams, but everything is going well. So I- I'm excited about the last half of the season. It, it seems like CFL much better spot than it was a year ago. I, I think around this time that we talked, you know, getting ready for the season, you know, it was the late start last year. What have you made of the, the quality of the game this year, scoring everything across the board? Oh man, it's a lot better. We're in a lot better place than where we were uh, this time last year. You know, sco- scoring is up. Uh, games have been exciting, even for the team's, that haven't won many games, you know, they've been in the game. So uh, at the end of the day, that's what, you know, we ask for. That's what the fans want. Of course, if you're a fan of a, a team like, you know, Montreal or any team in the East who's not doing well, you would like your team to win more games. But the games have been exciting, and that's all we can ask for. Yeah, I've seen you go back and forth. Now, a friend of our show, we had him on a couple of weeks ago, Gary Stern, kind of chirping back and <laughs> forth. I know that this will air uh, you know, Friday after after the Winnipeg game this week. But uh, talk about, I guess, first of all, th- this uh, pseudo rivalry that Gary Stern now seems to have with everyone on Twitter calling games you know, in their favor, you know, guaranteeing victories one way or another. You know what? I, I think it's great. And a lot of people don't like it uh, because the fact he's an owner. But I think this is great. This is great for the Montreal the West. This is great for the CFL. It's great for everyone who's a Canadian Football League fan. You know, you have an owner who's engaging with fans, who's on Twitter, who's on social media. Uh, not saying what those other owners are doing, they shouldn't be doing. But I'm just saying th- this is great. I love it. I love the fact that he's having fun. He's enjoying life. And at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about football. We're not talking about anything that that's important. You know, some of the things he say may be a little crazy. I don't know. But the fact that he's doing it, I 100% agree with it. And I enjoy every bit of it. Uh, it does seem like it's this new this year. You have Amar Doman in there. We have Gary Stern really kind of stepping up. Victor Quee. I mean, talk about the new, you know, these new leaders and management roles uh, really trying to figure out how do we get the CFL now into more of the modern, you know, into Twitter, into kind of getting the younger fan base, everything else. They, they understand what it takes and social media, like it or not, that's where it is. That's, that's where the young individuals are, the fans who they're trying to get uh, on board on the CFL. That's where they are. and You have to meet them where they are. So I understand 100% what these new owners and new presidents and what they're doing, how they're doing it. You have to appreciate it because they understand they're smart. They understand what it takes to get these young individuals. So uh, I'll do whatever I can to help out. Uh, you know, if it, if it calls for me going back with Gary Stern, you know, creating some content, whatever it may be, I understand what they're doing and I'm 100% behind. 
Uh, speaking of gear and the outlets, what do you make of, you know, the, the coaching changes now we're trying to get back on the right foot. They're still struggling there. I know Matt Dunnigan, there was like the witch hunt thing this week. I mean, what do you make about, uh, the coaching changes and get ready to Kahari over there? I, I wasn't surprised. I mean, I said this at the beginning of the year, you know, I said, uh, that GMs, he wanted to be the head coach. You know, this was his dream job. He grew up in Montreal, his first coaching job. Uh, was an assistant, a grad assistant, basically, or a GA, as they call him, at, with the Montreal Alouettes. And he went on and coached and had success in Edmonton as a coach and a GM. But his ultimate head coaching job, what he wanted more than anything, was to be for the Montreal Alouettes. Now, I wasn't, I didn't say he, he, was, he was hoping that Kahari wouldn't do well, but once that door opened up, once that team wasn't doing well, and it was just four games in, he stepped in. So I wasn't surprised about it. It's a difficult task. You know, they have some talent, but they don't have enough talent right now. And the t- person who brings in the talent is the GM, if I'm correct. So he, it's all on him. He said he doesn't want to be the coach going into next year, but let that team have some success. Let him go to the Grey Cup or do some, some damage in the playoffs. I guarantee you he will be the head coach next year. It just seems like, you know, going into the offseason, you know, they had a lot there. Vernon came on the show. We were really excited about Vernon, a lot of the guys they've retained. And I, what do you make of their struggles and just not being able to get everything going this year? It's a lot. It's a lot. And, and, and it boils down to the quarterback play. You know, they thought Vernon was going to be the guy this year, and that didn't work out. But Vernon had to know that they didn't 100% believe in him. I mean, they brought back Trevor Harris, and it's good to have a backup like Trevor Harris, but they brought him back because just in case Vernon was going to slip, and he did slip a little bit, and Trevor has played okay, but he's not playing well enough right now where you can say that team has an opportunity to compete and beat anyone, you know? And it's not all on the quarterback. They need some other things uh, to come together, losing their star running back early on. That definitely hurt him because he was the bread and butter. Not only that offense, but of that team, that team was going to ride his back, and he got hurt early, and that's definitely hurting him. But you know, they have enough pieces there where they can get a playoff spot in the East. Only two teams are going to make it, but they have enough enough pieces to get it done. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, it starts uh, this week uh, with Winnipeg, and then the next week they play Winnipeg. So uh, if they can compete and possibly win one of, one of those games, that would be uh, a big thing going for them going forward. It just seemed weird when we had Gary Stern on, it was right after the Kahari stuff and they were still kind of going back and forth. And uh, he had so many kind words to say about Vernon as, you know, leader and helping. I think he brings uh, his grandchildren, you know, Gary Stern, all that. And then he's like, uh, Trevor Harris, uh, I, I don't even know if I've met him in person. And Gary Stern was saying that. I'm like, that just seems a weird, <laughs> a weird dynamic to have, you know. And, and I know Gary and it's in Toronto and I just, it's an interesting situation, but it did seem odd to me that we're bringing in this quarterback now that the owner doesn't necessarily know replacing what is really the fan favorite leader of the team i mean i've talked with multiple you know outlets in the offseason saying you know vernon is our leader he is our guy that we want to go to battle for yeah and, and it has to be disappointing for vernon you think about what he's done in the last two off seasons on his own dime you know he's he's flew all the, the skilled players out to a location and they trained to form some chemistry and he did all this stuff, and now you look up, and I think now he's even on the sixth game. He's not even, as they say, part of the team because he's on the sixth game. This is not his team right now. This is Trevor Harris's team, and that has to hurt him. You see him on the sideline, and he puts on a good show, but I know down deep down that has to hurt him because this is not his team going into this season. He was expected to be uh, the franchise quarterback for years to come. So it's a tough situation. I hope he bounces back, and I even hope Trevor plays well because – we want all teams to be successful. Of course, every team's not going to win every game, but it helps the league and it helps everyone involved when all teams are able to go out there and win some games. So let's hope the best for Trevor Harris and these Montreal Alouettes, if he is the quarterback for the rest of the year. Uh, staying in the East, you know, talking Argonauts, all that, you know, getting back to 500, we had the weird, you know, they're leading the East and it was like one and four, whatever it was. You know, Andrew Harris playing good this season. What do you make of, of the Argonauts, Andrew Harris, you know, passing your record uh, with, with yards from scrimmage and the success that he's finding there? Yeah, it, it's excellent to see. You know, a lot of people thought that there was no more gas in the tank. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers, uh, they did offer him a contract, but it was one that, Maybe uh, someone of Andrew Harris caliber should not be offered, but he felt, you know, he still had some more Toronto and pinball and, and those guys over there felt it too. And you can see 
He's playing well. Of course, he didn't have the game he would have liked to have this past week because they keyed on him, but the man can still get it done. And and for them to have some success, he's going to have to continue getting it done. McLeod Bethel Thompson is okay, but he's not that quarterback that's going to lead you. Uh, they need Andrew Harris to me to be the main guy there. That means they need that offensive line to pick it up. They have some guys who can play on defense. Of course, they make some plays that aren't always uh, good at, uh, at, at those certain times, but like the guy, Chris Edwards, he's one of the best Sam linebackers in his league. It's just every now and then he'll get some penalties at inopportune times, but I would ride with him. But it's going to be on Andrew Harris back to lead this team. We know what he can do running the ball, but he's also potent outside when he catches the ball. I like Curly getting the junior. They got some other receivers. So they have enough where they can win the East. That's not saying much, but they do have enough where they can win the East. Are you an MD, uh, MBT guy? Do you like McLeod? Uh, I like him. I like him. Uh, I, sometimes he, he doesn't make uh, good plays. And that's every quarterback. Uh, like I say, he's not a top tier quarterback, in my opinion. He's the middle of the pack guy, but he, he, he plays well enough where he can win some games and keep them competitive. It's just when you're a top tier quarterback, every time you step on the field, you give your team a chance to win. And right now he's not there. In terms of Coach Dinwiddie, you know, I've seen a lot even this year. You know, he had some some gas last year. Classic management stuff. We're coming into this year too. I mean, is he the right person to, to be at the front of that team to kind of get them going, or is he still too inexperienced? No, it it, it, it takes time. This is his, if I'm correct, his second full year being the head coach, or second and a half year, whatever it may be. And and it takes time. And he's made some some bonehead plays. He'll be the first one to tell you that he said that. But I think he's the right fit for there. He's the right fit. He's going to make it happen. Uh, Your head coach is only as good as your players. I always say this. The head coach has never won game. He's lost game. But if you don't have the right pieces on the field, I don't care how intelligent, how smart you are, what type of game plan you devise. If the players on the field aren't good enough to get it done, I'm not going to get it done as a head coach. But I think he's the right fit for there. Will he get the opportunity to show that? Well, it remains to be seen. Because if they continue losing games in the fashion they're losing, you know, changes are going to be made. But in my opinion, I think he's the right fit for the Toronto Argonauts. Yeah, I mean, we saw, you know, the Red Blacks get their fabled first win, you know, last week, which was good. We have a lot of listeners of the show, Red Blacks fans in general, especially out there. Uh, Red Blacks finally getting in the W column. That, that was big. That was big. And as I said on air, Paul LaPolice will finally get a good night's sleep. You know, he's there's been a lot going on. You know, he lost his, his star quarterback to a gruesome injury and – uh, you know, now his, his backup is starting to get better, but it's still difficult. You know, a lot was expected of that team. They went out and spent so much money in free agency, and a lot of it was on that quarterback. And they were playing well. They weren't winning, but they were playing well, and they thought they were on their pathway to getting better, and then they lo- do that. But they got their first win. Uh, Caleb Evans played his best game to date uh, as a professional athlete. And when you start playing well, it becomes addictive. You start saying, okay, I can go out there and play well. And and, and, and the, the greatest, the most important trait to being successful is confidence. So I guarantee you after this game, his confidence is up. It's not going to be easy this week because now I think they have the Calgary Stampeders, which in my opinion is the best, second best team in the, in, the, in the CFL. But it helps to get that first victory underneath your belt. So and this transitions perfectly. So you're, you're saying you would put Calgary above my and America's team, uh, the BC Lions, that you think that Calgary is the second best team? Yeah, they're the second best team. Of course, Nathan Rourke is playing <laughs> better than any quarterback. But as far as teams go, uh, Calgary is the second best team behind Winnipeg. And, and, and Winnipeg is number one. It's not even close. And you got Calgary and BC is not too far behind Calgary. Yeah, what do you make, you know, this time last year, you know, whatever we talked, uh, you know, different feeling around the BC Lions, right? Certainly have to feel more confident this year if you're a BC Lions fan. Uh, I'm scared that we were front heavy like we were last year and we're going to fall off a cliff here, you know, especially how we lost to Winnipeg so badly. What was that three weeks ago? I mean, thoughts on, on BC overall as a team? You said not as good as Calgary. No, not at all. Not at all. And I love what they're doing. Uh, I love what they're doing on on defense. Uh, my good buddy Ryan Phillips, he really has them playing well. They're 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 flying around. They're making some plays. And Nathan Rourke, he can play. I mean, he makes everyone around him so much better. That offensive line over the last two years was struggling. They not saying anything bad about Michael Riley, but they put Nathan Rourke in there, and it looks like they are all all stars now. So they're playing some great Butler. I like him, but they're not at Calgary's 
uh, position yet. It's going to be remain the scene when those two finally play each other. That's going to be one of the better games uh, this season, but they're not there yet, in my opinion. Bo Levi Mitchell is back up to playing Bo Levi Mitchell football, and as long as that's the case, they can beat anybody. You see, they were right there with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. They didn't get it done, but like I say, I'm putting BC right behind the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, obviously, if, if if Winnipeg goes in, that you know, Montreal and loses here, we'll look like fools. But for, assuming that Winnipeg here continues undefeated, do you think they can go uh, all the way? I just was messaging with Darren Bomby and you know, big Winnipeg. He goes, I think you could do prop bets now on them going all the way through. I mean, thoughts on, <laughs> on Winnipeg this year? Oh my goodness, it, it, it's been crazy what they've been able to do. And I, I, I spoke this, and I said there's three opportunities where I'm going to give my opportunity to lose game. It's this week because they're the only team who hadn't had a bye. Uh, there are two row games in a row. They flew to Calgary, had to fly back to Winnipeg. It's a short week, now they have to fly to Montreal. The other one being the Labor Day Classic, which Saskatchewan, they're going to get up. I don't care how they're playing, how well Winnipeg is playing, they get up for that game. And, of course, into the season where they have the West wrapped up and they're sitting a bunch of players. But they have a great opportunity to go undefeated. But the question remains is if they're on the verge of going undefeated, if they wrapped up the West, what is Mike O'Shea going to do? Is he going to sit those players or is he going to give them an opportunity to make history and I think be the only the second team to go undefeated? So that remains to be seen. They're not thinking that far. All they're thinking about is this get upcoming game against uh, the Montreal Alouettes on Thursday Night Football. Yeah, I really, I was watching the end of the Calgary game last week. I really hoped, it just for some sort of entertainment from non-Winnipeg fans, that Calgary would get it. It just, it, it, Winnipeg always seems to find find a way to win. They always seem to find a way to come back. I, what did you make of Calgary? Like you said, second best team, but just not quite being up to that level yet. That Winnipeg team is tough. They're not only physically tough, but they, they're they mentally tough. And it starts with Coach O'Shea. I, I talked to Brad Foddy. Brad Foddy is the uh, equipment manager there. He's been there for over three decades. And he said, this is, and he's like, he didn't want to disrespect any other times. You know, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers were there, but he said what they have right there now is something special. And it starts with Coach O'Shea. You know, he, he's created an atmosphere there. And it's almost like I equate it to when you were in elementary school and you went in line to get, you know, for lunch and you would have kids who wanted to break in line. You had kids who wanted to give other kids money so they can get their food up front. When the Winnipeg Blue Bombers get in line, everyone knows their role. Everyone doesn't care if they're in the front or if they're in the back because they understand what their role is. And that's what they're doing with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And as long as they continue doing that, as long as they continue having that attitude, it's going to be difficult to beat them. Of course, you know, things can happen, injuries, bad plays. But as long as they stay on that path, it's going to be difficult for any team to beat them. Are you a Cody Fajardo guy? Uh, I won't say I'm a Cody Fajardo guy. I like that he's tough, uh, but when he's not 100% healthy, it's difficult for him because he relies on his mobility so much. He relies on his, uh, his abil ability to be able to run the ball, and he can't do that right now. So that's difficult. He, he's not a true drop-back quarterback because he likes to move around, and he can't do that right now. And until he can do that, it's putting that team in a bad place. They may need to sit him. I know they have a bye week, but they need to sit him, maybe to sit him, so he can get uh, healthier, so he can move around. So it's going to be difficult if he's not mobile. I've just never seen. I was talking with Danielle last week from the from the uh, state. Uh, Rough Riders. I've just never seen such a controversial guy that's like very like milk toast, like the, the, the most normal guy in the world. But then it's like this Latin. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, some some people may call it passionate. Some people may call it. I, I don't know, sensitive, whatever you may be. I think it's right there in the middle. I think he wants to do whatever he can to win games. I mean, he's a big fish in a small pond. It, it's tough when you're in Regina. When you're winning, thing is perfect. You could do whatever you want. But when you're losing and you're the starting quarterback, it's not an easy place to be. You know, it's the gift and the curse. And right now they're losing and he's not playing well. So there's a lot of tension. I mean, it, it, it's tough on him. You hope he gets back to winning. You hope. He can get back healthy and, and get that team to the place they want to be because there's a lot of pressure. The Grey Cup is in, in Regina this year, and they're expected to be there. And the path they're on right now, they're not going to get there. Yeah, I don't see it is. And I remember even like preseason that they were like, oh, we should overspend the cap in Saskatchewan. Like we need to go like basically buy whatever we can't buy the Grey Cup, but they're not even close right now. No, they're not. And, and, and it's difficult because they, they still have time. But it's tough. They're in the West. And if there's a good chance, and 
I'm sure they would never say this. They're, they're better off maybe crossing over to the East, you know, coming in fourth and crossing over to the East because it's tough in the West. Those top three teams, Winnipeg, Calgary, and BC, they are crazy good. Crazy good because good coaching staffs, and more importantly, they have good quarterbacks who know how to win and know how to play. So it's going to be tough on those Rough Riders. Anything can happen. They have some good talent, but they may have a better chance crossing over to the East and getting to the Great Cup that way. Uh, just around the other conversation over here before I let you go, you know, Elks uh, coming in, playing BC, you know, we, a lot was made off season, you know, Victor Quee coming in, we're doing all that. Now we're doing like uh, singles mixers, right? We're trying to do that. I guess first <laughs> off, do you like that idea? Like we're going to do singles mixers in the quarterback club or whatever? You got to do whatever you have to do. Like I, like I alluded to earlier, hey, they understand, you know, you're, you're trying to attract a different crowd. You know, it's not the same crowd as it was 10 15 years ago or even five years ago and you have to do whatever you have to do i think they're doing a, a poutine night in montreal on thursday night hey these owners and gyms understand you have to go a different path to create a different atmosphere to, to get these different fans there so i'm 100 behind them i mean if they need to have a milt stiegel grow his hair out night i don't care what it is i mean i'll have a cul-de-sac but whatever it takes to get these fans back into the CFL, hey, they have to do what they have to do. Well, I saw that. that I think Gary tweeted or was responding, and I said, I said, you need to explain to me what this is. It was like a 90 Canadian, $90 Canadian or whatever. But yeah, the helmet with the poutine and that, like, is that a good 90, 90 Canadian? Is that a good deal? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, 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 I've never had, well, I've had poutine was, it was in front of me, but I, I don't know. So I guess that $90 gets you in the game. Does it get you unlimited poutine? Does it get you a real helmet? Does it get you an art autograph from Gary Stern? Because I'm sure that's priceless right now. So it all depends on what you get, what you get. But I'm sure it's, it's well worth the money. You'll see an exciting game. Uh, it's some great things, a great at that atmosphere in Montreal is excellent. You know, that the background and everything. So I'm sure they're doing everything to make sure that that atmosphere is great. And that $90 and that poutine, which is one of the Montreal favorite delicate testings. Hey, go out and enjoy it. I'm sure you have a great time. Yeah, I'd better be in Gary Stern's private suite in the you know owner's box there if I'm paying ninety dollars to get to have to eat protein <laughs> and go. Uh, but just around that, you know, Edmonton struggles this year, right? You know, even quarterback issues and Cornelius started again. Trey Ford was out. Like, yeah, you know, it seems like Trey was really they, they were finally on the right path. He gets her uh, final thoughts on Edmonton before I let you go. Well, you know, they've won a, a couple of games. No one was expecting them to do much damage this year. And, of course, uh, when they implemented Trey Ford, they thought, you know, well, this is it. You know, we have a young quarterback we can believe in. Of course, it's going to take him some time. But because he is mobile, because he can run the ball, he gives us a chance. But he got hurt. And they implemented Taylor Cornelius. And we saw him win a game. And you never count a Chris Jones team out. I'm never going to do that. Yeah, he's making a bunch of changes weekly. But Chris Jones – always has a plan. This, that man is very smart. He's won great cups as a head coach, as a defensive coordinator. He knows what he's doing. It may not look that way on the outside looking in, but Chris Jones spends too much time at his job, at that office, to not say he doesn't know what he's doing. So I'm never going to count him out. It's going to be tough. They're in the West. They don't have that legit quarterback. They have some other pieces they're trying to get together. But I'm never counting out a Chris Jones team in each and every game, regardless of who they're playing because of what he's been able to do. It's just weird, you know, and we're colored, you know, our friend of the show, Matt Mangle, you know, he was on there as the puncher, got released. They bring in John Ryan, who was like, a, a not, <laughs> it was not playing at all. And then got signed. I mean, what did you make of that? The Chris Jones, like, well, I want that now. Like he was, I could have had him two weeks ago, but now we're going to trade for him and then release Matt Mangle. That's what mad scientists do. You, you never know what's going to happen. You know, they, they go back in the lab and they're creating things and they don't like it. Things blow up and they come back out and they say, OK, what am I going to do now? That's what Chris Jones is doing. So we should never be surprised by some of the moves he makes. I mean, he may call me up later on and say he needs an extra DB, not even receiver, a DB. He may do it. But that's what Chris Jones do. But as I alluded to, I'm never going to count him out. I'm never going to say what he's doing. That makes sense. Because he's been successful. So how can you say what he's doing is not making sense, sense when he's been successful in the past? So give him some time. It's not going to happen this year. Let's be honest. It's going to take a lot for it to happen this year. But years to come, and I guarantee you, Chris Jones will have a successful team uh, in Edmonton. 
Uh, well, Mill, I thank you very much for taking time again. Busy schedule, doing all this to come on. I uh, just, uh, you know, be nice. I see. I was kind of researching this morning. I see a lot of articles like, does the CFL panel like each other? Or whatever. I just hope you guys all have fun. <laughs> I just hope that you guys all get along. Like I enjoy it, but I'm just like I don't want that to be the overshadowing, you know, lingering thing here. I mean, what what do you make of that? You know what? We talk about football for a living, so we never take each other serious. Uh, I know some uh, pundits take this job serious, but man, I, I talk about something I've been doing since I was four years old. I talk about it and I get to watch football. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to have fun. I let my hair down all the time. I enjoy it. You know, sometimes we have to be critical of others, but at the end of the day, we're all going to have fun and we love each other. I mean, how could you not love this beautiful face? I don't know what, what you're going to say about your face, but how could you not love this right here? Uh, last question. You said nothing was off the table. I want to know your opinion on Matt Dunnigan's beard. You know what? Hey, he had to go with it. He had to change it up. Would I ever cover up this beauty? No, not saying Matt is ugly, but you know, every now and then you got to change your looks up. You know, you, you, you want to make things different, but I have no problem with it. You know, Matt keeps himself in shape. He works out hard. So uh, I have no problem with it. Uh, well, Mel, thank you so much again. Uh, good luck with everything, and I really appreciate you taking the time. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. Take care. Go Winnipeg! Well, I'm excited today. We have Sarah Saeed here with uh, the Parlay and FanDuel Canada. I'm always excited to get more female voices on here. We had Danielle Ponticelli on last week as well because the CFL is kind of so male-dominated, a lot of older kind of white uh, journalists. I like getting a, a wide range of opinions. So thank you so much for coming on. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Uh, so talk me through. So you're with the Parlay uh, covering CFL. What's your role kind of in the CFL sports media for people that aren't familiar with your work? Yes. Yeah, so I do pick videos daily um, and pick videos are basically like something we do in-house where we'll run down like what a certain matchup will be for any sport. So I do a lot of women's sports as well as CFL. Um, so for example, the Tiger Cats are playing the Toronto Argonauts. This is um, my pick for it, like betting pick. Why is this my pick? And and kind of sharing those uh, clips on social media. Um, we're not a sports book, so you can't place an actual bet on the parlay. But we just like to, you know, make some fun content. We um, also do side. So I also do like like profiles and other kinds of stories and fun fun content um, on social media, not just betting things. So that's kind of what I do at the parlay. Well, that's great. Yeah, we were talking. So Steve McAllister, when you're, you know, the higher ups over there, he was on our show, I mean, like a year ago, nine months ago, talking about this as well. So great to get more of that on. What spurred kind of your interest in the CFL and wanting to be part of that, you know, wanting that to be part of what you cover? Yeah, I have a really weird the career path. Um, I started in the fashion world um, in the journalism space there. Then I went to the veterinary world, also journalism, so um, veterinary news. And then I went back to school during COVID because I wanted to do broadcast news, um, you know, did some internships and stuff. And then I through there, my, my prof was a sports guy. He worked at TSN and he just like showed me what it was like to, to do some sports reporting and sports storytelling. And I kind of fell in love with it. So, um, the parlay kind of found me, but the reason I gravitated towards CFL was a lot to do with just me loving football. Um, and obviously Canadian sports are really exciting to be a part of. Um, so it was kind of a win-win for me, especially as a person who's really into history, um, to kind of see Canadian history plus football, plus, you know, being able to have access to these incredible players was just like, that's kind of, it was like, I fell into it, but I also was so excited to find it, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Yeah. So you live in Toronto, you cover, you know, primarily the Argonauts and then also work on kind of special features throughout the CFL. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so what do you make of, of the Argonauts this season? The, the kind of coming back, I think they're at 500 now, you know, uh, uh, McCall Bethel Thompson, he is a long time, you know, we're a supporter of him at the show here. Uh, what do you make of the Argonauts through the season and what you've seen? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny because I find that the like last game with the Ottawa against the Ottawa Red Blacks, I was very surprised that they lost. Um, I 
it's the inconsistency that I would say kind of gets me. Um, but I do think they're a solid team. I think like just overall, um, when they, when there's that connection, like I know, like example, McCoy Bethel Thompson was struggling to connect with Brandon Banks at one point, but then there was a switch up there and we're seeing like Curly Gins Jr. Killing it. Um, you know, obviously went to McManus who I was telling you, I was doing a profile on, he was killing it. And so it's just like an Andrew Harris, of course. So it's kind of just, I find like the inconsistency um, this season with the Argos, maybe finding that connection with each other as a team. And once they do, they're all good. But once that one connection is lost or the momentum is lost, it's a little bit questionable, (laughs) but, um, but they've been great to watch though. I've really been enjoying watching them. Uh, well, it's good. So, you know, the, the whole big thing with, you know, CFL and last year they passed, you know, Bill 218 or whatever, wanting to bring in all this gambling and sports betting and fantasy, moving everything kind of into the, the, you know, the modern era with the CFL. What's kind of the reaction that you get for, you know, your videos and your pieces and when you do these daily pickums? Um, I haven't gotten any like negative reaction. Um, I know a lot of people are not necessarily like who are sports fans and maybe don't want to have as much betting content out there. Um, but at the same time, it is kind of an amazing thing to be able to be a, to, to have here in Ontario and just to be a part of, because like, even though, um, Yes, it's a lot sometimes to see like commercials everywhere and all that, if, especially if you're not a sports better, it's like you're it's just only going to grow the, the sports that we have in Canada and in the GTA. You know what I mean? Like having the chance for people in Ontario to, to bet on the Leafs, to bet on the Raptors, to bet on the Jays. And also obviously the CFL, like it just makes that attention to Toronto sports and Canadian sports that much bigger and Americans can get involved and things like that. And, and we kind of feel more connected also um, to just like the big leagues. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if I get any negative reactions so far, thankfully, but you know, it's, I get, I get why people are apprehensive sometimes. Well, it's funny. I mean, even in the USFL here in the States, we cover that and you know, it's almost, yeah, the sports betters I talked to almost liked it because nobody knew what they were doing when it came to like USFL betting. And so they were really able to capitalize on that. That's interesting. Uh, you know, as someone, you know, younger demographic, right. Female, we talk a lot on the show about, you know, Toronto and kind of the Argonauts being kind of lost in the mix of the city there. What reactions do you get from, you know, your friends and coworkers and family when it's like, you know, I cover the Argonauts or, you know, cover in part the Argonauts for the CFL? Yeah, people in Toronto don't care that much about the Argos. And, and that's just the straight up truth. And it's not because we don't have great fans here. We have amazing Argos fans. I've met a lot of them and like they are probably the best people I've ever met in my life. Um, it's just that, you know, the... Uh, uh, I guess because we're so used into the GTA in the greater Toronto area to have these... Um, big leagues that are affiliated also with the states that obviously have a lot of funding, a lot of advertising, a lot of um, just brand recognition and team recognition. It's kind of like the art, the, the CFL kind of just falls to the wayside. And because, you know, Toronto has all these other teams, like people don't think of the CFL as like necessarily like in Toronto and then the GTA as necessarily being something that they um, want to invest time into. But yeah, so I I definitely get a, that's where I get the reactions where people say like, what, why? But at the same time, I always tell my friends, like people won't go to the Jays and pay 20 bucks for a ticket and don't watch the game. You know what I mean? Like, like sometimes sports is about the experience and connecting with people. And I brought my friends to an Argos game literally last weekend. um, And they had so much fun. You know what I mean? It was like the same thing as being like, at a Jays game or something like that. And I think for me, when I, when I see that it gets me excited because I'm like, hopefully, you know, that's kind of something that can continue in Toronto to kind of bring the team up. (laughs) What do you, you know, what would you like to see more of in terms of the CFL and engaging those young fans, engaging new fans? I mean, we hear all the time, you know, it's, it's, kind of an older league, right? It's an older white league. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I think the strongest part about the CFL in terms of their history and the legacy is so important, right? But I do think it also kind of hinders sometimes of, you know, trying new ideas. Now, obviously we have Victor Quee coming in, trying things in Edmonton and, you know, Gary Stern with the Alouettes going crazy on social media and stuff. But, you know, what would you like to see done by the CFL to help engage? Uh, is it more content like you're doing? Any, anything else? Um, it, it's hard to say because like, 
like you said, they, I feel like everybody has an idea of like, what can we do? Um, my opinion is that the younger generation really is the future. Um, if you talk to Leafs fans, they were been fans since they were like literally born and have the Leafs won? No. <laughs> so, you know, like it's more than just like some, cause some people say, oh, they need to win. They need to do this and do that. They, they do win. They do a good job. They, ha- they won a great cup. Like a few years ago, you know, it's like not that it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily that aspect. It's more to do with the emotional connection that fans will have to a team. So, um, or to the league. Um, so you see that a lot with the riders and the bombers and the tiger cats too. Um, so I definitely think it's out there. And like, even when I was talking to Argos, um, fans, they were a bit older generation. They were saying that because I asked them that question, I said, how, how, what do you think about the younger generation getting into it? And they said that, um, that they would want like that they don't have a they don't think it's an issue because they have always wanted their kids to be involved and their grandkids are going to games right now so that's kind of nice to see it's kind of has to be passed on um in terms of the league itself and what they can do like again i'm not like a marketing genius or anything like that but i do think that like you were saying like people like gary stern getting on twitter and interacting with people like that's the world that we live in now you know it's like it's kind of having those connections to the bigger names and um, being able to have those conversations and even just joke around like on Twitter or something, it makes people want to be involved in that community. Do you know what I mean? So I think definitely just being more um, active online and open and open with the younger people too. I don't really know how to get the younger people, maybe play, have some football events, but you know, well, no, but I think that it's helpful. I think having you, you know, I think you were tagged in the, like, the, they're calling it, you know, the new female women of Twitter, right? You, Christina Constable, Danielle Ponticelli, uh, you know, in terms of trying to branch out and generate some new content, like you are through the parlay, you know, trying to figure out digestible ways that people can kind of get involved, you know, with the CFL in terms of your, you know, daily picks and stuff. How do you go about kind of putting that together and, uh, you know, uh, sending that content out? So we have a great team at the parlay. So it's definitely not just me that does um, those videos. Um, So what I'll do for the CFL picks, for example, is I'll write um, a script in advance, you know, obviously do research. What do I think the, um, the likelihood of which team to win is um, what the players are looking like, what injuries are looking like, what's the momentum, were they off a bye week Were they, did they lose badly the last game? Things like that obviously looking at the odds. So I'll see, um, from there too, like, what's a bet that maybe that, that, that is actually going to be like valuable to bet on. Um, so combination of those things, the ones I'm done with the script, I have, we have some editors, we just send it over just to confirm that everything's all good. Um, we have studio, we go into, we have a teleprompter, read the teleprompter, um, record the video. And then we have other editors who work on like making the video all pretty and great. And, um, and then, yeah, then we just post it on social media. So it's really a simple, um, way of doing it, but it's also like, there's so many great people that help me out with that for sure. And yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I think it's good in in terms of uh, uh, trying to get deal breaks. Yeah, a lot of feedback uh, are are these helpful videos? Do people enjoy them? <laughs> Have you heard like oh, I've yeah, I made made a lot of money on these? I haven't gotten anybody telling me like I've made so much money off of these. Um, hopefully, nobody's lost money off of them. <laughs> that would be horrible. I do not. I, I'm sorry if anybody did, but um, no. I mean, I've gotten like the feedback that I have gotten, like just in general, is people just want to see more of it like so a lot of times i'll just do the like one or two videos a week um and i did have like somebody reply to me on twitter uh one saying like do you do this for all of the teams for all of the matchups so you know there are people out there who are looking for um more guidance with betting especially with cfl um but i mean like it is, I'm not going to lie. Like it is a little bit nerve wracking to put my pick out there sometimes just because things change, right? Like you can't predict sometimes what's going to, what the outcome of the game is going to be. And it could be something as simple as weather. It could be like, maybe that the, maybe their flight was for some reason, a little bit more delayed or something happened. And, you know, like so many factors go into it, but you know, just as long as you can, as long as I can back up and explain why, like I try to be confident with my bets. (laughs) Well, but it's important. I think it's important for the CFL. You know, you can't just 
you know, say, okay, we pass sports betting. This is going to be great. You know, you need to figure out different ways to drive that interest, right? I know TSN Edge does that as well in terms of, and I've talked with uh, Aaron, I think over there about that, trying to get more content out that way. But it is, it, it's, it's one thing to, 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 uh, you know, present this as this is something that you're able to do, but then it's another thing to be able to say, okay, here's content now that you can use to like uh, work around that and, and uh, you know feel like you're educated and partaking in that. You know, it's 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 not it's not just a one step process there. It's a couple of different steps to get people actually involved in the games, playing fantasy, gambling, things like that. For sure. And then also the odds change. So, you know, you never like if you're reading my pick or watching my pick video, you might uh go on to the site later on, whether it's FanDuel, Bet365, whatever it is you use and look at it and then the odds might be different and you might make a different choice, you know? So it's it's kind of one of those things where, um, like I said, there's so many factors involved and like so many different steps, like you said, that like it's really up to the better themselves. And um, and you never know. Like if that's kind of what makes sports betting fun is like, you know, especially it's like you kind of hate, let's say like a player does scores and you didn't expect them to score you didn't bet on that sometimes it's like frustrating but at the same time it's that's what's so exciting about the whole thing uh you talked earlier you know cfl and, and the crowd engagement right getting fans involved what what is your favorite part of of the cfl game and, and being able to cover it oh my god definitely the fans and the community like it's i when i went to touchdown atlantics um a few weeks ago in halifax uh it was probably the most fun i've like ever had because there was obviously saskatchewan more fighter fans as well as argo fans and they were so passionate about the game passionate about their teams and also just like want to truly truly have fun and connect with each other um even they were just like also hanging out with each other and doing things and there was events going on and and like they were really you know so excited to be able to be supporting the league. And I think like for me, just, I'm so extroverted. I don't shut up. Like I cannot stop talking to people. I love, it's just part of my personality. So to be in an environment like that, to be able to speak to all these different kinds of people about what their thoughts are on the CFL and what, what they hope the future is, what they, how they feel about it now and all these different things. That's my favorite part for sure. Um, and also just even connecting with the players. I think like at the end of the day, they all have stories to tell and it's just like really great to be able to tell those stories. Are you, are you feeling good for the Argonauts here? Kind of as we've moved past the first third of the season, like how are, how are you feeling for them just in general vibes? I, I have good feelings, but at the same time, you know, playing the tiger cats coming up for like a few games. Um, it's, it, it could be, uh, um, like I said, the momentum could be crushed perhaps <laughs> depending on the results, depending on even the environment with the fans and stuff like that. I know there's, that's a huge rivalry and Tiger cap fans are very passionate. So, you know, it could kind of go both ways, but um, you know, so far I feel like, like I said, when the team is like locked in, it, you can see how feel like it just makes sense, especially when you have like, I always talk about Andrew Harris, but when you have Andrew Harris, like doing what he does, for example, um, or just like, like I said, also too, like Curly Gins Jr. has been killing it. Like when you have these key players who are consistently showing out, you know, it's probably, it, it it's a good team. It's just that it's probably more than just the like skills themselves. It has to do more with like the emotions behind it that could prevent them from maybe getting to where they got to be. That's my opinion. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, as someone newer coming into the league, covering that kind of the, the reaction that you've gotten across from you know, other media members, other fans and stuff, because, you know, I mean, we're American. And, and when we got into all this last year, it was a little bit of like, OK, who are you? Like, what's going on here? You know, OK, welcome to our world. What's it been like for you kind of joining the, you know, the CFL media, for lack of a better word? Yeah, it's been great. Everybody's been so nice, welcoming and helpful. I'm not shy to say that I'm new and I'm also newer to the sports. So I'm okay with that. You know, I'm the kind of person that will ask questions that will do the research that will try my very best, you know? Um, but also sometimes I just don't know things or I, I wasn't there when an event happened that everybody remembers. And so I have to do that extra research. Um, and I'm okay with that. Like, I don't think that, the, I think that that's, it's, part of life. Sometimes, you know, you change career paths and you do different things as long as you're passionate and you're willing to like 
immerse yourself fully and in, in like in a genuine way. I think it's all good. And I, everybody that I've met has been so supportive of that. They've honestly like been excited to teach me things. They're like, oh my God, Sarah, like, you know, this is some advice for this. Or, um, you know, that they'll tell me about some history that I don't know, or they'll connect me with somebody. So that's, I'm really thankful for that. <laughs> Uh, we'll get well. So Sarah here with Parlay uh, FanDuel Canada. So if people want to learn more about you know your daily picks, more of the see more of the features you're doing. Right, you do a lot of specialized features, you know, on players. Right, you did the Touchdown Atlantic, you know, trip and all that stuff. Where would you have them check out? Where they get, can they get all that content? Yeah, so definitely follow the Parlay. It's at the Parlay P A R L E H. Um, you can definitely follow me on, and you can follow Parley on Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok. Me, I'm Sarah Ann Said. So Sarah, A-N-N-E-S-A-I-D. Um, and also like I'm on everything. So yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, this is great. Like I said, love meeting new voices, love having new, diverse, younger, you know, uh, female voices, everything uh, coming on the show. Uh, so thank you so much again for sharing your time. And we'll, hopefully we'll get you on again here, you know, talking to Argos and everything else, CFL. Sounds great. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited today. We have Simone Eli on with WKRG out of Mobile, the the, the crusader against all that is Frank Murtha and uh, and MLFB. Now, Simone, how are you doing today? I'm I'm doing well. I'm still kicking. I haven't been like you know dug up in a backyard somewhere at the hands of Frank Murtha after all of this uh, MLFB talk. But man, it's just it's just been a whirlwind. My goodness. Well, yeah. So obviously, you know, I had hesitated against doing a lot of MLFB coverage the last few months on the podcast, yep. and this is kind of why. But uh, you have come to light, you know, Twitter and everything else really shining the light. You were there for a lot of this. And, you know, we're talking about the collapse now, the collapse of MLFB. Yep. Uh, first off, I want to just know, how did you become involved? Because we all live in this alt football space. Like we all know, sure. and, uh, and, you know, we've been tracking the AAF equipment that they bought back in, you know, 2019. <laughs> or whatever to this. So how did you get involved in this MLFB nonsense? Well, honestly, um, it was because we found out that the MLFB was going to come to Mobile. And so we're in the middle of what I would call like the dry season. There's not a lot of it, you know, in sports, but the dead of the summer when nobody is in school and there's no college football or high school football or things to talk about down here in the South, we'll pretty much take anything that we can get. And so we find out through um, the Mobile Sports Authority that MLFB is going to come here. And I'll never forget it. We were sitting in the office one day and we get that phone call and I'm like, who the ML of what? Like, what, what is this? And so obviously coming off the heels of the USFL and the success that they had, um, you know, we're thinking, okay, well maybe this is a thing. Well, it took about 30 seconds of a Google search to realize that this is really not a thing. Like this has never gotten off the ground. You know, if you go through like the Wikipedia page of the MLFB, like they have a title for every single every season, like the almost season and why this one failed and the money wasn't here. Frank Murth of this. And so my, my sports director and I, names Randy Patrick, looked at each other and we're like, there's no way. There's no way they're going to bring almost 400 people to Mobile, Alabama, house them, have a training camp. Like we were so doubtful from the beginning. And we said, there's, this is not going to happen. And so sure as heck, uh, they showed up and I'm like, all right, well, they're here. Um, maybe this is, uh, is actually going to roll. And then the practice begins and it's like, okay, well maybe this is legit. So that's really how things got started. And, you know, in mobile, um, you know, we're a good sized market. We're not the biggest market. Obviously Birmingham is in the state, but um, when you have something like this coming to the city, um, to a stadium that has kind of gotten some bad pub recently because of some shootings that have happened at high school football uh, games and, and really not a lot of, um, revenue building for that stadium. So if you see anything coming to the stadium or coming to the city, you know, we're going to bite it's sports. It's, you know, it's football. So we want to see what it's all about. And so that's really how things got started, man, just to, when it comes to our coverage and our knowledge of the league. I love this. I love this already. You're my favorite person to interview about this. I'm, I'm so excited because it's so weird. So, you know, because we got into, you know, I started podcasting after the XFL 2020 went bankrupt. So the, yeah. I missed the whole AAF existed, then the XFL and then AAF went bankrupt. And MLFB had bought a lot of the old pads and equipment from AAF. And so from the second that Paul, my old co-host, and I started the show, people, what's up with MLFB? What's up with MLFB? And I sure. never got like, because we've talked about the Spring League and there's fan control football and we talk about, I mean, there's a, there's all these different 
But it's this legend of the MLFB because for whatever reason, like they own the old helmets. And so people yeah. think that that, so I've never gotten it from day one, even this year when they, you know, they're, they're going to camp. I go, we don't have a TV deal. We don't have any sort of broadcast. You know, there was rumors, oh, they're going to be on like Amazon or Netflix. I'm like, I don't yeah. see them being on Amazon. No way. But even when they were in training camps, I'm like, I do not believe that they're, I, I firmly believe no. they're not kicking off. And then lo and behold, so it, it kind of, all the news came out about this time last week. I mean, yeah. it all just kind of broke that Sam Shady, Sam Jess, he's one of our uh, sports reporters comes on. He had gotten a call from, I think a couple of players or agents that were like, we're locked out of our hotels. You know, we can't get, or we're, we're being asked willingly to leave. Like, how did that all go down for you guys? Okay. So it's a, it's a crazy story. And it was so I had just been uh, coming off my sister's bachelorette trip in Nashville. And so quite frankly, I was not really paying attention to what the heck was going on in Mobile. I had been gone for like an entire weekend. And I got back and I'm sitting there again with Randy. And I look over and I'm like, hey, man, what the hell is going on with, with this leak? Like, like they're, I saw something on social media, like they're having a jamboree. They're doing something. Am I, I'm not lying to you. My husband is a high school football coach down here. So like any, like there's some local guys doing stuff with equipment. And so like, he was sending me some things like, Hey, you know, this is actually kind of happening. And so I looked at Randy and I'm like, Hey man, like what's going on with this league since I've been gone. He's like, Oh crap. I got a call from a guy, um, you know, uh, with the mobile sports authority yesterday. He wanted to tell me something. Let me, let me call him. So this is Thursday. And so he calls him and I, he's just, Randy starts laughing. He's like, I told you, man, I told you enough. So I start laughing. I'm like, I, well, I don't know what's going on, but I know, some crap is going down already with this leak shocker. He gets off the phone, but kind of come to find out this is when we're getting news that these guys are getting kind of kicked out of these hotels. So we look at each other and we're like, well, well crap, this hotel is like a five iron from our TV station. So we get in our personal vehicles and we ride over there and sure as heck, there's 20 football players sitting in the lobby, half a dozen coaches, uh, a couple of league of officials, if you want to call them that, um, out there, everyone's like got their panties in a wad. And I'm like, wow, like this is, this is seriously like unfolding right now, right before our eyes, we're watching it. And, um, it was crazy because there was, there was like a, it was split in that moment. It was like, all right, here's the people that want nothing to do with us. Cause I let them know who I was. And, and, you know, like, like, I'm not trying to go in there and be secretive. Like I'm with the media, whatever. Um, and then there was like folks like, okay, no, I want to tell you what's going on. And I'm like, well, I want to hear about it. Like what, what's, what's happening. So that's really how we got word of the, the first kind of falling out. So we went down the road, here it is, all these folks. And, and you're seeing a, a couple different things. You're seeing some guys just sitting there looking like super just down and depressed and you feel for them. I mean, you're like, what the heck? And then you're seeing some coaches getting in Ubers and piecing out. So the, your questions become, how are these getting, where are they going? How are they getting out of here? What's the next step? And that's really how things really started to unravel here a week ago. Yeah, there was a league uh, this time last year. It was like the NGL, I think is what they call like very similar thing where they, all the players showed up and it's like, they ran out of funding. Um, yeah. It is funny, you know, because I used to work in local news too. Like some of the things you get, like this is why local news exists, like national no media doubt. and everything and all that. But like you yeah. never get the like, oh, it's down the street from our house, like you Seriously? know, from our station. Like <laughs> we're going to you know, and, and being able to get that. So, you know, you're interviewing players, you know, uh, Frank Murtha, right, has was never in mobile. Never in mobile, right? never came here, no. Yeah. He he never came here. And so when when I'm there, I first person I talked to was an assistant coach and I said, Okay, like what's going on? And that's when he tells me. We're just in, so we came off the football field, we come back to a hotel, they delivered us lunch and we're in meetings and we get a knock on the door that says, get out. Like y'all need to evacuate immediately, like not evacuate, but whatever they were like, get the heck out of this, out of this meeting room um, and get your stuff out of the rooms. So by the time these coaches are going up to their rooms, there's staff members up there, security up there, taking, you know, locks off doors, the, the key, the key uh, that, that goes on the magnetic deal, telling players to get out. If players aren't in there, they can't go back in to get their stuff. Apparently some hotels were saying they're going to charge them to try to get their stuff to get, come out of the rooms. I mean, it was, it was a mess. And the thing is, is that you feel for the guys, but you also have to understand that the, that these hotels are trying to protect their business. You know, they made an agreement from what I've gathered, you know, after multiple days is they made an agreement with, with the league that, Okay, let's just say the league owed the Marriott five hundred thousand dollars for the total stay. Well, they pretty much said, "Well, you can pay us on like a, in like weekly installments um, on this." I don't, I don't even think they ended up having to put much down up front. And here's my thing: I have never stayed at a hotel in my life. Maybe I'm wrong, where I have not paid to stay there. 
like immediately. Not only are you paid the rate, but you also have to pay the incidental fee. Like, I mean, it's a significant thing. I was, I'm always stressed out checking into hotels. Well, these guys are all in these hotels for almost two weeks and the coach is even longer with hardly paying any money. I mean, then that's crazy to me. So yes, I mean, there's a lot of folks that are like, all right, well, these hotels are, are in the wrong for kicking these. No, they're not. I mean, they're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars every single day because there, at first there was an issue with a credit card. Then they were trying to get a bank, uh, a, a, a transfer from the league and all. I mean, they were just kept egging them on. Then the money's going to be there on Monday, like all of this crap. And and it never came to fruition. So of course they had to, to protect themselves at that point, they're already at a huge loss and they still are today. And it seems like, um, that's not, that's not going to, to change or be improved whatsoever. So, um, it was just crazy. And then that's kind of when like the, the reality set in of like these guys, having to figure out their own way and to fly out of mobile is a pretty penny. I rarely do it because it is so expensive to go anywhere. Even if you book well in advance, if you're booking the next day or even the same weekend, it's, I mean, you're talking one way ticket, $600 plus because it's a small airport and only goes to certain places. It's not like a hub. You can, I mean, it's not like new Orleans. So a lot of folks try to go to different cities in the area to get a cheaper rate. But I mean, these guys can't afford that. I mean, they were handed $50 bro for, for two weeks. Um, on, on the field. Like, and I'm not like, a, not like a direct deposit. It was like, here, man, it was like, it was kind of like one of those, like when you get done, like uh, at kitty camp, like everyone gets a granola bar. It was like, Hey man, here's your 50. Okay. Here's your 50. Like that's how they got this money. And that's all they got. I mean, these dudes have nothing and now they're expected to pay their own way. And, um, and I think some other coaches ended up putting some up in hotels, but man, it's just, it was unbelievably unfortunate to see, uh, the initial fallout. And then it's really only gotten worse every day. You bring up the hotel thing. So this exact same thing happened last year. We had the Spring League that, that that became the USFL, right? Spring League last year, they played a hub in Houston and Rice uh, Stadium. And then they played in Indianapolis where the Colts play. They played mm-hmm. in um, the oil, whatever that. Lucas uh, Oil Stadium. Yeah. Lucas Oil Stadium. Same thing. They owe the city of Indianapolis $1.4 million. They've yeah. never paid it. They've never yeah. paid it. Like, I don't yeah. understand how these leagues come in. And they, like you said, yeah. I, I'm charged, like Expedia, I'm charged a deposit, a retainer. They have my card on file. I know here, if you take $1.4 million, you can come stay here. No question. And, and the thing is, I'm not trying to, like, say, like, whoa, it's Mobile compared to Indianapolis. But, like, any sort of economic impact in this city, which does great. And, like... Mobile Sports Authority has really done a good job bringing in, you know, certain events or certain groups who have brought revenue to the city and things. But like that's a that's a big loss. And it's not just the hotels. It's also the bus service. If it's also a catering service here, they're probably out, you know, over one hundred thousand dollars. The bus service out, you know, just as much, if not more. And the hotels, I mean, we're looking at over a million dollars that these that these companies need to be owed. And a lot of companies, privately owned, family owned companies, um, you know, really can't like just consume that, absorb that and just, just move on, you know? So that's, it's really, it's an unfortunate situation in that regard. Um, but then you start to wonder, okay, it, it takes three seconds of a Google search to realize that there was a huge risk in this, you know, that this was never really gotten off the ground in the past. And so, um, you know, where does the fault lie in that? I don't know. Should you have asked for more money up front? Well, common sense says, yes, that didn't happen. Lad stadium and, you know, got their 30 grand, um, but I also find that weird, man. It's like, okay, Lad Stadium got 30 grand and so did the three other places, except for the three other places didn't house training camp, but they all got the same amount of money. So I never understood that, why why they all got the same amount of money, why it was all up front when really Lad was like the the beginner training camp, you know, before games were even supposed to start um, this week, I guess. But so I don't know, man, it just seems like a lot of folks got the raw end of the deal from the mobile services here, from the players, um, coaches. Um, although we later found out that, you know, some of these good coaches were making some pretty good money. Um, you know, and then I ended up talking to one this past week and that was just a whole nother, a whole nother can of worms. You know, it's when they told, when they came out and they said that they were, you know, not being paid for training camp, that's always a red flag for me. Cause like even yeah. XFL, they've announced next year, right? They're coming in February. Yeah. I think it's 5,000 a week that you're getting paid, but then training camp, you're getting 800, right? Some skin in the game, right? Obviously we're not paying everyone five grand to go through training camp, but when it's coming out, they're saying, yeah, you're going to play here for three weeks before you even get a paycheck. Like that to me was always a red flag from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. No question. I mean, yeah. And, and the thing is, these guys, um, they, they were hoodwinked. That's the word that I'm, I was, I was told. Genius. They were hoodwinked. They were sold on something um, that 
you know, their hopes and their dreams are to play football and to stay alive in, in some sort of semi-pro or professional capacity. Um, yeah, they're really willing to take a chance. And I know some guys missed out on some combines and some other things they could have gone to potential other opportunities for this one. And honestly, it just, it was sold really well to them supposedly from somebody um, to get them here. But, you know, it, it's so crazy what has happened since then, you know, this, this past week, uh, I got an email, pretty lengthy email from an employee, it was a coach uh, from one of the teams that talked about them getting that check reversal, which was just crazy to me. So on Friday, everyone got their standard pay, their standard contract to pay. And this is what doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So they're contracted to work from July 1st to September 30th. Every single week they're paid on Fridays. So beginning July 1st, they were paid every single week. Well, last Friday on the, I think it was the 29th, everyone got their check. You're well, talking, on, you're talking staff, right? Yes. The players staff. We're talking staff. staff. Yeah. Players still only got their 50 bucks. So staff, I mean, they got paid on Friday. Well, come Tuesday of this week, that was reversed. So it's literally deposited into their bank accounts and it is reversed on Tuesday, um, taken out of their accounts. And this coach told me he called his bank and said, can you stop this? Like, this is money that was owed to me. So despite like the fact that it's totally wrong, they signed a contract to be paid through September 30th. And they're not going to do that, obviously, because they don't have any money. But this was hours actually worked the week before. I mean, that they actually worked and were due. And instead, um, this money is just taken back out of their bank accounts and technically legally they had five days to do it. And so in that regard, I guess they were allowed to do it, but it's just crazy to me that in that same breath, Frank Bertha is, is just putting out statements that are honestly just lies. They're actually lies to say one, that their first goal was to help coaches and players get out of the city and get home is completely not true. I sat there and interviewed multiple players at the airport who paid their own way, who had to call their aunts, uncles, um, whoever to pay for these tickets, had no way home, nowhere to stay the night before when they got kicked out of the hotels. So it's just not true. All the coaches paid their own ways. And then to say, to even put out there that this is just a postponement of the season is total BS. It's total BS. I mean, I can get up on my high horse right now, but it was a lie from the beginning. We're seeing the fallout continue. Then they're pulling paychecks from everybody. I mean, why even try to continue? I'll tell you why. Because he thought people would continue to try to invest into this into this company. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know a bunch about stocks because I don't. And I don't care about the stock market. My job is not to care about the stock market. My job is to report the news and the facts that we find them uh, out to be in this entire situation and this fallout, especially for our city. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because he is trying to sell something to people that he knew was dead. He knew wasn't going to get off the ground. and. I mean, I had a one league official telling me in the hotel, oh, we're bringing them back in two weeks. Well, no, the hell you're not. Y'all don't have a dime. Well, that's the thing is, and we said this last week, we had, I had Mike Mitchell on, kind of like I said, right as this all kind of came out, I said, anybody that would come back in two weeks is insane. I mean, it's like, this was your window. I, you know, whether it was genuine or not, they were trying to do it or not, right? I don't, like you said, with the stock market, all that. And Frank Murtha really was sitting there and he's like, we are making this happen. Nobody is coming back now after you've defaulted on payments that have to be kicked out because what trust at all no do I have that you're going to get like they're going to pay me at all when I and if I do work then you're going to take money away that I earned anyway. So no question, and you better find a different city because there ain't a, a one single hotel or caterer or bus service in this city that's going to house you. Like that ain't happening. I mean, once burned, I mean they're not coming back, and so. I mean, it, it's totally unfortunate. And I actually found something out later. I haven't even put out yet. I was going to share. Um, so the Wednesday before the Thursday, the D-Day Thursday of everything blowing up, the Wednesday before uh, the Alabama Airborne cut five players. And so those five players were sent back to the hotel to leave. I mean, like they, like the coaches told them, Hey man, like we got to get these guys. They told like two officials on the ground here, get these guys some airfare. Here's where they need to go. Like you need to get them out of the city. They're not part of the team. So the team gets off the practice field. Well, these five guys are still at the hotel and the coach is like, Hey man, like why, why are they still here? Like they're, they're not on the team. The officials are like, well, what did you want? Like same day travel. And they're like, well, yeah, like they're not with us. Well, they're like, well, can they just, can they come to dinner tonight? And then we can get them out in the morning. And they're like, bro, how are you going to have these people that just got cut come to dinner with a team? They're not even on, but again, like not football minds, not people to understand the game anyways. Well, they book them flights, bro. Okay. So they book them flights on Wednesday. All right. The day before everything went to, to crap. Maybe this is what pushed them over. They book them flights for the next day out of Pensacola, which is about an hour automobile. So come Thursday morning, 
Alabama Airborne is practicing at Ladd Stadium. All right. These five guys that got cut the day before are in a freaking car going to Pensacola to fly out. Well, they do. At the same time that they go and fly out, everything is getting shut down. And so these guys who got cut, it's like a blessing in disguise. They got their stuff paid for by the league. And there they are on a first flight out of Pensacola that day. So come to find out the guy that took them had the keys to Ladd Stadium. The team has since been back in the hotels. They didn't even have the keys to go to Ladd to get their equipment out of their lockers to leave after the league starts to shut down. So it's just crazy to me to, to hear that guys who were cut end up getting out. The guys who were still on the team or potentially going to be on the team going to training camp had no ability to get out. I mean, it's just it was total chaos. I mean, that was just one thing behind the scenes because there were, there were so many other things like the bus service. And it wasn't on the bus. It was on the organizers. Like there was people not being able to go to practice because there wasn't enough bus room. And again, it wasn't the services. It was the organizers. This was never organized from the from the onset. It's always been such a mess. And man, it's just it's just crazy. And it's crazy. It, it's like. And, you know, Randy and I sat here the day it all went down and said, there's no way this is going to happen. And sure as heck, I said, there's no way they play a game. And guess what? They're not. It just to me, and I and I laugh just because the chaos of it. I mean, I don't you know make light of any of the players getting sure. caught and all yeah. this. And that's what's so frustrating about all this. It's like you said, it's these guys that put their lives on the hold, miss combines, miss other practices, yeah, take time off of work, maybe left a job. Hey, I'm going to come out. I'm going to work for three months. And then to be stuck out there having put in time, have no money, have to spend your own money to go back. Like that's the most frustrating. You know, I'm a contract worker too. That's the most yeah. frustrating thing. It's like, well, now like I gotta pay money out of my own pocket to get out yes. of this situation Crazy. Though, without yeah. being paid. Yeah. And apparently, um, I was also told that the for the people who came to Mobile, so not coaches, but players, a lot of their flights weren't booked until the day before. Well, okay, anyone who books flights the day before knows that you're gonna pay a pretty penny. So that in and of itself, I think it was kind of a red flag for a lot of people realizing like, okay, they don't have their stuff together. The guys they're inviting to training camp to kind of go through like a tryout service. Um, you know, they're, they're like the travel agency was trying to get names and all these flights are getting booked late. And so they were honestly way behind the eight ball, even more so than probably what we think right from the onset. Um, and honestly, I just think that Frank Murtha and whoever his cronies are, were gambling with, with people's lives. They were trying to, they knew there was a huge risk. They knew the money wasn't there and they were hoping people were going to invest in something because they had this motto of cleats in the grass. And if you go back and you look at videos, marketing videos, whatever you want to call it from several uh, months ago, they're like, we're going to have cleats in the grass. That was like their sales pitch almost to folks to like invest into this company. And because they ended up having a jamboree, which had like 10 people there, and because they ended up going through some practices, like they thought people would be like, wow, this is real football and nobody bought it. And literally and figuratively. And, and here we are today. It was funny. They did part of that social media was they had like, it was like a five step plan. And it was like, step one, Stupid. create a professional football league. Like step two, <laughs> I'm like, that is, that is a large step for step one. Like, but it was, and then it was other things like, you know, market and grow whatever. It was like, step one, establish a professional football I mean, league. I mean, I mean, it's the most like doesn't even make sense. Like, and the, like the, their organizational plan from the onset was was a, it seems like a scam. I don't know how else to put it. It seems like it was a scam from the beginning. And it's and we laugh about it. And we're like, oh, I told you so, and all that. Real lives were impacted. You know, guys who don't have a whole lot are they going to see that? I don't know. I saw one report that said maybe some guy guys saw some money. I have yet to hear that. I hope that they do because you know a thousand bucks. I mean, shoot, that's a lot of money to me. I don't want to go pay. $400 for something that's not my mind to pay. So if I did, I would expect to see that back. And so, you know, I hope for the, for these guys sake that they do, I hope that they get other opportunities, but what a complete disaster. And, uh, it, and honestly, like, I, I don't see the money coming back for the city vendors anytime soon, if ever. So just to round this out, because I could talk to you about this forever. This is fascinating. No question. But, uh, so have you talked to Frank at all, or has this all been through statements? Okay, no. So that that's another thing is that I have reached out to just about every single number, email, whatever that you can possibly reach out to when it comes to anyone in the corporate part, if you want to even use that term loosely, corporate, corporate MLFB, if that's a thing, doesn't even have a website anymore, um, about anything. And the only thing we got was initial statement, which was no comment. That was the Thursday of the mess. Then they then we were told kind of under the table, hey, there's gonna be a a, a statement tomorrow that is going to one show that we have the money and talk about like a future plan, which is not what it was at all. The official statement that we got was, Hey, 
we hate this happen. We're going to postpone the beginning of the season, which is total crap. And we're going to help guys get home. And that's literally, other than that, it has been radio silence. So I don't know. I'm sure there's lawyers involved. I'm sure that there's, hey, you know, they're trying to not be responsible or liable for things, I'm sure. And the vendors here, you know, aren't really talking a whole lot because, you know, they don't want to get in bad. They want to see that money come back to them. But is that going to happen? Very, very doubtful. So that's kind of where we're at now. It's like this holding pattern and I don't know. Saw somebody tweeted something a minute ago about them losing entirely any funding that they had that was that was going to be back back the league, and so it's just going up in flames. I, you know, I really hope that for the future that this isn't attempted again because because history says that it will be attempted again. History says they're going to to make another effort to pretty much sell these guys on their hopes and their dreams and convince somebody in some city somewhere to do this, and it's it's not going to work. It's never worked, and it's not going to. Yeah, yeah, I we saw the tweet too. It said that uh, the ten million dollar equity line they had was pulled. So yeah. it yeah. seems like, but like I said, it, you know, if you're banking on that, they supposedly had money. I mean, that's the question of like, yeah, you know, they came in. I've heard they had thirty million, whatever. Like, where did that go? Did they ever have all that? I know Frank Murtha paid salaries to write to himself and everybody else. So this is. I'm just going to tell you right up front. This is something that I was told by someone that I would say is a credible source in the league. Now I haven't asked other folks about it. Um, this is somebody who I've gotten a lot of information from and it's trustworthy information, but this, it just seems, I'm not saying this isn't trustworthy. I just think that, I, I don't know. I don't know how much there is to this, but I'm going to share it anyway. This is a podcast, not a newscast. So I can do that. I feel like I, this is a safe space for me to share something that could potentially be hearsay. Is that okay? That's fine. That? I mean, we're, okay. we're prefacing this. That this is, you know, a second head account. Yeah. But yeah okay. So what I was told was, you know, they, they purchased this equipment and the equipment was in San Antonio. Is that, is that true or not true? The, the equipment was in Texas somewhere. Uh, I would say when the AAF shut down, I think they're, I think they're, yeah, continue. I'm going to research. Okay. Well, so what I was told was that the equipment was in San Antonio and that the league, and again, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you right now, I don't know. I, I picked all of this up, all this MLFB up stuff, just like how we started this conversation when they decide they're coming to Mobile. So a lot of history with alternative football leagues, other than like, you know, the Birmingham Stallions a couple of years ago, you referenced and the USFL, like it's not really our mojo down here. College football is, so I don't have a huge ton of like history, but long story short, I'm told that major league football tried to kick things off in Texas and they wanted it to be somewhere around this equipment. I don't know if it had to do with the equipment being there, but they wanted to like kick off training camp and have all of the things begin in Texas. Well, apparently they looked into trying to do things at the Alamo Dome, but it was too expensive to do at the Alamo Dome. Then they looked at somewhere in San Marcos and they felt like it wasn't a good enough city to do in San Marcos. Well, the reason that this supposedly matters is that one of their top investors who was good for 10 million was based out of Texas and said, if you're not doing it in Texas, I'm not in. And again, I, again, I'm not like, I'm not stating this as fact. Again, I'm telling you this is something that I was told. I don't know about all of these stocks and investments and what was going on behind the scenes. But what I was told was one of their primary investors was based out of Texas and said, because of the way that it would it would be with taxes and some other things with the state, if this isn't happening in Texas, then I'm not in. And at that point, it was a little too late to, to, to completely backtrack on trying to start the league with or without this person's money. Again, that's just something that I was told. I'm sharing it because you were just referencing where did this money go? It sounds like that could be a big chunk of it. Um, what that really means, I don't know. But that's, I think that the initial thought process was that it was going to start in Texas. So there could be some, there could be some, you know, clout in that. But this guy was good for a lot of other information. And so I could see that it being, it could be, there being some truth in it. Yeah, no, and that's this with what I remember. So back, they purchased the equipment. This was November 1st, 2019 MLFB. They bought a lot of the AAF commander stuff that was obviously based in San Antonio. So that, that, that definitely correlates with what my memory was as well. So they said they sold about 50% of the stuff to, uh, including, uh, team laptops and other AAF inventory. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, it just seems like it's all shuffling around and uh, it's just been, I don't know. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for the guys, unfortunate for the vendors, where it goes from here. It doesn't really seem like there's going to be, you know, anything positive, but I don't know. 
Uh, well, Simone, uh, this has been uh, very fun. I really appreciate it. I hope that there's some other upstart football thing in Mobile so we can bring you back on because I would hate Listen, if this was a one and done to have you come on and talk us through all this. This has been like the most exciting thing I've covered since I, I was in Mobile. I mean, I've been here a year now. I, mean, I was in Birmingham the last five and obviously there's a ton going on in Birmingham and we had you know the XFL and the Stallions and all the crap, whatever. And uh, so down here, I mean, this is kind of like a wake up call. Somebody tweeted at me and said, Simone thought she's going to go to Mobile and just live this quiet life. And then the MLFB started. And I was like, you know what? That is the truest thing I've read. So here we are, you know, and honestly, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I, it's opened up like this whole new world of people who are super, super interested in like alternative football leagues that I didn't really know existed because my life is consumed by Alabama and Auburn and high school football here. And so to see just how many people are super interested in this and knowing what's going on. Um, I have definitely grown a sense of appreciation uh, for that. It, it's a weird, I've, I've even talked, you know, we're uh, XL, uh, XFL is coming on board now, right? They're getting ready for their February. And I've even talked to some of their people and I'm like, this is, you really need to be ready for like the fan base that you're targeting here. When, yes. you're, in the, when you're in the alternative football, like it's a very weird, uh, hardcore, passionate fan base. So yeah, it definitely is that, but it has been super fun to be a part of it. Even if just for a brief, even if only for a week or so, it has been a, uh, it's been delightful. <laughs> uh, well, Simone, you guys, thank you so much for coming on. Hopefully you'll have some quiet, uh, quiet days ahead here, but I certainly no appreciate your uh, recount of everything. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, as always, to all of our guests for stopping by. Greg Parks, a long extended interview with Greg. Greg's getting ready, uh, ready to go back to school here. I think he is in school now as you listen to this. So really appreciate that last minute, you know, recording from Greg fitting us in before he goes back to, you know, his, his real job uh, during the school year. As always, Milt Stiegel taking the time out from traveling, doing the CFL panel and all of that stuff to come on the show to talk CFL. Sarah Saeed, really appreciate that with the parlay coming on. And then Simone Eli, the late minute addition to come on to kind of entertain us all football fans with her ML, uh, FB talks. Really appreciate that. Uh, so last week on the show, during my interview with Mike Mitchell, I realized that uh, I hadn't actually challenged Mike to his wager. You know, he lost his wager. We had the Toronto Argonauts when they came and, and uh uh, played the BC Lions earlier this season. BC wiped the floor with them. Mike Mitchell was supposed to sing O Canada on the show. We kind of forgot. So I said, well, if you had made it that far in the episode, uh, you know, send me a DM, send me a Twitter, say O Canada. I'll put everyone in and try to figure out, uh, you know, someone get a prize for like listening that late in the show. I got a lot of responses. Zach, everyone did that. I got a lot of XFL writers, uh, you know, sending me stuff. I'm decided the, the winner this week, uh, and, and I'm, I'm doing this as an olive branch, Cheese Soda Jake, uh, listener of the podcast. Uh, I am extending the olive branch. You know, I, sometimes I, I think I make Jake a little grumpy with all my talks. Jake, I, I think, tweeted in about 15 minutes after the episode. It like, wasn't even enough time to have listened to the episode. I don't know if he just like skipped forward to the MLFB stuff with Mike, but Jake, uh, send me a DM. You get, you know, within reason, we're talking like a t-shirt, a hat. I'm not doing the hundred dollar gym bag. Uh, I, I'll send you an item from the XFL shop. You let me know. It, it's great for me. Cause I don't have to mail anything out. We'll just send it that way. But cheese soda, I think that's your username, but Jake, you know who you are. Uh, just, but just remember this. Remember Reed is not always a bad guy. Uh, all you people, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we ruffle feathers on here, but uh, I really stand by uh, the journalistic work, especially this week, the journalistic work that we are doing on the show, uh, pointing out things and, and voicing our opinions on that. Uh, I think that will do it for me today. Uh, should have some big announcements here coming up. Lots of good guests. I have the next two, I think two or three weeks lined up with guests. So really exciting. Already everything set up for next week. If you like the work that we are doing in the world of the CFL, I have great CFL guests coming up, XFL and USFL. You know, please like and subscribe. The wind is blowing here. I, I think this should sound okay. I'm going to log off now before I uh, test my limits too much with uh, trying to hold off the wind and uh, elements today. So thank you guys so much as always for checking out the show. Like and subscribe. We'll see you next week. Take care.